London, 1953. Josephine Daunt and Susan Dervish both worked for the Ministry of Defense during the Second World War, doing top-secret, highly dangerous espionage work. But in peacetime, they find themselves without a job and feeling useless. Determined to put their talents to good use, they decide to set up a detective agency with the help of former private I. Bill Mackey. And now Daunton Dervish. It's London, 1947, and in the middle of a heat wave, the witness box in a divorce court is hardly the most comfortable place to find yourself. You are, Mrs. Daunt, a private detective, are you not? That's correct. Would you describe yourself by any chance as the best private detective in the country? Certainly not. That would be immodest. I see. And yet, despite this self-confessed mediocrity, you were engaged by Mrs. Swinburne to spy on her husband. Why was that, do you think? That depends on the meaning of your question. In the first place, because she suspected her husband of having an adulterous affair. Several, in fact. And if you mean why myself and my colleague, because we're women, I imagine. Because you are women and would therefore bring a certain, shall we say, intuition to the inquiry. If you like. A certain intuition and, of course, a certain prejudice. I don't accept that. Mrs. Daunt, we are in the middle of a heat wave. Let's not raise the temperature further by losing our tempers. Now, Professor Swinburne is, unlike yourself, at the peak of his profession. You are aware what that profession is? Yes. He is a heart specialist. He is indeed a heart specialist. A man who travels the country saving lives. And you seek to sully his name. I don't seek but to sully... But you do, Mrs. Daunt. You do more than seek. You quest. You are complicit in dragging Professor Swinburne's name through the mud of the divorce court. And where is your evidence? My evidence. Your evidence! Hmm? Is it more than a kindly glance to nursing staff here? A friendly word there? Is it more substantial than the encouragement an experienced professional might give to a young novice? I think it is, yes. Then I wish you would demonstrate it to us, Mrs. Daunt. Give us something definite to go on. All right. Give us a I... shard of concrete proof. Very well. Give us the merest hint against this man of the heart. This rabble, as you put it, is a selection of the young nurses whom Professor Swinburne, shall we say, led astray, and whom my colleague and I have painstakingly traced. You may question them at your leisure. I think you'll find that your man of the heart was also a man of, how might I put it, a point further south. <laughs> Daunt and Dervish by Guy Meredith with Anna Massey as Josephine Daunt and Francis Barber as Susan Dervish. Episode 3, Some Commandment or Other. That is what I call cutting it fine. I was getting a real grilling in that witness box. Do you think I was having an easier time trying to ferry a bunch of nurses in from around the country in sweltering trains? Mm. Has that water run cold? No, you could make tea out of the tap. Bill, how are those fans coming along? Uh, I've unpacked them. Where did he find them? All the shops are sold out. Apparently he knows a man who knows a man in army surplus. Bill! <laughs> What on earth is that? Yes. Uh, not quite what I was <laughs> expecting. I was hoping for something you could plug in. Property of the 14th Gurkha Rifles. <laughs> you need a bunker wallet to operate these. And at my current perspiration levels, that would be unwise. Mm. I'll get the door. Do you, um... <laughs> 
do you think we could rig them up in some way? A system of uh, pulleys and weights, for example? No, I think we'd be better off shutting up shop for a couple of days and heading for the coast. Bank holiday weekends upon us. Brighton will be more crowded than London. We could go somewhere slightly more select. Cromer, perhaps. We've nothing on that we couldn't postpone. Not postpone? Really? I'm surprised to hear such a successful partnership speaking in those terms. Mr. Philip de Souza. apparently you know each other. From Swinburne versus Swinburne. Exactly. And you scored quite a first, Mrs. Daunt. You know, I'd never lost a divorce case before. I'm sure a little humility won't go amiss. Uh, excellent, very good. <laughs> uh, talking of humility, this is your office. And my home, Mr. de Souza. So, what can we do for you? Do? I should have thought that was quite obvious. I want to put some work your way. What sort of work? Not another divorce case, I hope. My hope is equal to yours, Miss Dervish. You see, it's my wife. I want you to investigate my wife. no shade here at all. If Jennifer D'Souza doesn't come out of the house soon, you'll be taking me home in a bucket. If she doesn't come out soon, I'll admire her resistance. Living opposite Harvey Nichols and not in there by 11 o'clock. Do you really think we should be doing this? Hmm? Josephine, stop window shopping. Should we be working for D'Souza? We have to be realistic. He's paid up front. And if his wife's been acting suspiciously for the past couple of weeks... That doesn't mean she's cheating on him. It may simply be that D'Souza sees so much of that sort of thing in his job that his imagination's working overtime. Then we're in the clear, aren't we? <sighs> Wait. The door's opening. That must be her. Jennifer D'Souza. She's younger than him. Very good-looking. And coming this way. Harvey Nix it is. Try to restrain the glee in your voice. We can't set ourselves up as judges, that's the thing. We simply provide evidence. Oh, where's she gone? Taking the left past headscarves. But if she is seeing something, It's still better that we break it to D'Souza rather than some clod-hopping gumshoe. I suppose. Assuming it has to be broken to D'Souza at all. What do you mean? Hold on. She's gone out the far doors. Not as interested in shopping as she seemed. Shame. Are you suggesting that if his wife is having an affair, we don't tell D'Souza? We could just warn her that he's suspicious and advise her to stop. We could, but then we'd be Daunton Dervish, marriage counsellors, wouldn't we? She's slowing down. Susan, I think you'd better put away your scruples and take out the box camera. Oh, very well. Over my shoulder. Tell me what's going on. It's a three-story house. She stopped by the basement steps. Looks like a separate flat. She looks nervous. Really? Perhaps it's her dentist. Except I don't think you'd fix your lipstick before visiting the dentist, would you? She's going down the steps. The door appears to be open. What's happened? I don't know. I think we should find out. It's all right, Mrs. Sister Sousa. What is it? Oh, my goodness. And that is the first time you had seen Ian Allardyce. Yes, Inspector. We came down the steps, through the door, and there he was. Draped over Jennifer de Sousa. There was quite a lot of blood. Hmm. Mr. Allardyce is apparently a struggling artist. Though this wasn't exactly his usual type of struggle. Apart from visible injuries, he had two broken ribs and a dislocated jaw. Did he say anything to you? Nothing intelligible, obviously. We simply called an ambulance and stayed with him until it arrived. And Mrs D'Souza's comportment throughout this was... Shocked. Horrified. Also speechless. Hmm. And as for your presence at the scene of the crime, do I take it you can neither confirm or deny anything? Inspector, you've already impounded our camera. In which, surprise, surprise, there was no film. But no matter, it doesn't take a genius to work out that when a married woman visits a young bohemian and two 
private detectives are in the neighbourhood, there may be a certain amount of surveillance going on. And as for who your client was, we can't please divulge, don't right. waste your breath, Mrs. Daunt. It's fairly obvious, isn't it? I know my rights. I cite my rights. I demand my rights. Philip de Souza, you've arrested him. I am a blasted lawyer, damn your eyes. The most obvious suspect, wouldn't you say? Of course, the inspector was right. De Souza is the most obvious suspect for the attack on Allardyce. Do you think he really could have done it? What, beaten up this young painter? Hmm. Hmm. He's no alibi. Well, not according to Inspector Blakemore. He arrived early at Chambers, as was his habit, and was due at Reading Assizes in the afternoon. He could have stopped off at Knightsbridge on his way to Paddington. He certainly has the motive. Agreed. But only if he suspected his wife was seeing Ian Allardyce. And if he did, why didn't he tell us? Fair point. I would have thought so, but the inspector ignored it. Came out with a lot of guff about men in the throes of jealousy, not thinking straight. Is that right, Bill? I couldn't say. I'm not generally speaking the jealous type. Oh. As I know, women tend to be disappointed by that. Which women? Josephine, forget it. Why is Susan still in the bathroom? Oh, she's developing the photographs. We stowed the film in a dustbin. Only just got there before they were emptied. The question is... Is de Souza, for all his belligerent rhetoric, really capable of violence? I don't know. However, I think I might have an additional light to shine on the matter. Really? What? Well, when you called from the police station, the name Allardyce rang a bell. I couldn't quite think why at first, so I went down to the library. To relax your powers of recall? No newspaper section. And though one really oughtn't to tear things out... Here. Railway boss in divorce battle. Sir Bernard Allardyce, head of Southern Railways, yesterday lost a divorce suit brought by his wife. Sir Bernard Allardyce. Yes, and look at the final paragraph. Lady Allardyce was represented by Mr. Philip de Souza, QC. When was this? Just over six months ago. Oh, I should have remembered it myself. So de Souza probably inflicted the same inquisitorial treatment on Sir Bernard as he did on me. But who is Ian Allardyce? According to who's who, Sir Bernard's son. That's a rather curious coincidence. Or perhaps not. I think a visit to the supposedly scarlet woman is in order. Mrs. Daunt, please take a seat. Mrs. de Souza, thank you for agreeing to see me particularly following the disagreeable events at Ian Allardyce's flat. It was awful. Mm. But your composure was a comfort. You'll be aware, I imagine, that the police have arrested your husband for assault. Yes, they contacted me. The ground seemed very thin. Policemen hate barristers on the whole. They'll have been delighted to jump in feet first. You'll perhaps also know that your husband was, or perhaps still is... Our client. Do you mind if, if I smoke? No, please, you're at home. I, uh, I was aware of certain suspicions that Philip had of me. Those suspicions, I have to tell you, are groundless. You're referring to an affair with Ian Allardyce? Yes. I can assure you categorically that no such affair was taking place. I see. Was today your first visit to his flat? No. I've been there four or five times. Then... Ian Allardyce is an artist. He was painting my portrait. Your portrait? Yes. But why didn't you tell your husband? It was to be a surprise. His birthday's next month. The portrait was intended as a present. Oh, I see. And this morning you were going for another sitting? Exactly. Well, uh, Obviously, that puts a different complexion on things... But are you aware who Ian Allardyce is? I think he has a certain reputation in artistic circles. No, I mean, he's the son of Sir Bernard Allardyce, against whom your husband recently won a divorce settlement. Of course, I'm aware of that. That's how I met Ian, outside the court. Really? There must be many portrait painters around. Wasn't he rather an odd choice under the circumstances? Do you think so? When my husband takes on a case, it is a professional matter. 
He bears no personal grudges, so why on earth should I? But he would have borne a personal grudge if he believed you were having a sexual liaison with Allardyce, whether that was true or not. Yes. Yes, I suppose so. So would getting hold of the wrong end of the stick have prevented him from wielding it? You mean, as a man, is my husband capable of violence? Exactly. I'm sorry to say that he is. I wouldn't brush your teeth in the bathroom for a while. The fumes are pretty noxious. But the snaps are developed. Oh, let's see. Hmm. Interesting. An elephant. What? Oh, yes. That office trip we had to the zoo. There were a couple at the beginning. The D'Souza shots start here. Here's Jennifer in front of Allardyce's flat, going down the steps. The open door, you can just glimpse Allardyce there. She looks genuinely taken aback. Oh, yes. The interesting thing, though, is here, at the edge of the shots, this man in a donkey jacket emerging from the side passage to the house. And breaking into a run here. Do you think he's the assailant? Well, he could be. That would put D'Souza in the clear. Possibly. Unless he'd simply hired a thug to do his dirty work. Yes. Now, the only man who can really throw light on this is Ian Allardyce. But I don't think we'll get much out of him with his jaw interaction. In the meantime... I wonder if his father can help us out. Do we have his address? I'll try the Southern Railway offices at Victoria Station. There must be some way to get in to see him. An official carer, sir? Yes, it's a new post under the National Health Service for patients who we feel are under cared for by their relatives. We're concerned that Sir Bernard hasn't been to visit his son. He is in the building. Oh, yes, yes, bank holiday weekend or not, you can't keep Sir Bernard away from the office. Well, busier than ever at the moment. Really? Why is that? Well, don't tell me it was different in the hospitals. It's all very well, this public ownership, Lark, but the upheavals... Of course, nationalisation. I'd forgotten mm. it was just around the corner for you, too. Yeah, it's a mess. Everything has to be accounted for. Do you think I might wait here in the lobby for Sir Bernard? Well, you won't have to wait long. That's him now. I trust that's all clear. Well, absolutely, Sir Bernard. Just a signature. That's all. I'll have a quick word with him now. Uh, no, hold on. I couldn't let you put it in. Sir Bernard, William Mackey, Royal Marsden Hospital. Oh, what now? Are you aware that your son has been the victim of a serious assault? What? Uh, I'll be going, Sir Bernard. Are you also aware that a woman he was seeing? Royal Marsden Stop. Hospital. Stop it! I'll put you in the bloody Royal Marsden Hospital. Sir Bernard, calm yourself. You want in here, whoever you are, and tell me about my son. Yeah, I've got him, sir. I'm sure we can discuss this without fisticuffs, can't we? Oh, now look, papers everywhere. Oh, oh, oh mind oh, your heads. Oh. Let me pick them up. The papers, that is. For a knight of the realm, he has quite a temper. I realise that was a useful qualification when you were beating off Spanish galleons. That may have been the reason for his divorce. Uh, the temper bit, not the galleons. Which wouldn't make him that different from D'Souza, if Jennifer's to be believed. Well, so you think the two men might be locked into some sort of King of the Beasts struggle? It's possible. D'Souza takes Allardyce to the cleaners in his divorce, so Allardyce gets his son to seduce Jennifer as revenge. But what about this portrait? I can't say I'm altogether convinced of its existence. I think she was making it up. Perhaps. But it would also rely on Ian Allardyce being willing to seduce her. Susan, don't be naive. You've seen her. He's a man. Before a lot of tearing with the same brush goes on. Yes, Bill. What's the sheet of paper you managed to retrieve? Well, it's rather disappointing, really. There were forms all over the lobby floor, but they were quicker to them than I was. What was clear is that the other chap's a railway inspector of some sort, even though he seemed to be in Sir Bernard's thrall. And this, well, probably the least revealing of all. Simply two alphanumeric sets. 38TM493734, 38TM578634. Some sort of code, perhaps. Perhaps. Although why would Sir Bernard and the inspector communicate in code? 3-8-T-M-5-7-8. Now, wait a minute. I've got an idea. Give me a moment. She moves in mysterious ways, that woman. That she moves. I'm wilting in this heat. Do you want me to give the fan a go? <sighs> no, it's not that. I, I can't get a clear picture. Either D'Souza beat up Ian Allardyce, or someone else did. Either 
Jennifer D'Souza was having an affair with a bohemian, or he was painting her portrait. Either Sir Bernard Allardyce was taking some sort of revenge on the man who took him to the cleaners in the divorce settlement, or... <sighs> I know. <laughs> and any way about it, there's nothing in it for us, financially, at least. But do you think that would persuade Josephine to give up? Eureka! I have it. Look, what do you make of this? It's an ordnance survey map. Indeed it is, for North Kent, as it happens. Those alphanumeric codes, Bill, aren't codes at all. They're map references. TM is the map section, and the following six numbers are the grid positions. So, 493734, what do we find? Um, Easting first, then northing, blank space. Precisely. The wartime editions were full of rather cack-handed attempts to cover up secret locations. No one seems to have considered that it rather gave the game away, or that the Germans might simply not have bought the latest version. And the other map reference? Same thing exactly, about ten miles away. So where does that get us? I've absolutely no idea. Except there seems to be a railway joining the two places. A branch line, yes. Curiouser and curiouser. I think we should pay one of them a visit, don't you? Right now? I'm afraid so. Look again at the numbers Bill gave us. The first two have nothing to do with the map reference. 38. 3, 8. 3rd of August. Today's date. Oh, and Bill, perhaps you should check in the meantime on Ian Allardyce's progress. Yes, Mr Mackey, Ian Allardyce is now able to speak, but no, Mr Mackey, you may not talk to him. But if the police were there... I can hardly refuse the police access to a crime victim. What I can tell you is what Mr Allardyce told them. Dr. Fox, ah, please go to right. the maternity ward. Go on, then. Absolutely nothing. What? He wouldn't give them any information. Why not? Mr Mackey, I'm a doctor, not a psychiatrist. Now, if you'll excuse me, we have quite enough teething problems in the National Health Service as it is. Yes, of course. Thank you, Dr. Phelps. As you were, go straight to ear, nose, and throat. Can't speak, then won't speak. You. I recognize you. Mr. D'Souza, you're out of custody. And you're with those blasted detectives, aren't you? If you want to put it that way. But well, what are you doing here? Here we are. Curlew siding. Yes. Where exactly? Well, somewhere down this embankment. We could hardly ask the taxi driver to deposit us on the tracks. What exactly do you expect to find here, Josephine? Why shouldn't a railway inspector have map references to a good job in his possession? I don't know. Why wouldn't the head of Southern Railways visit his son in hospital? Too oh. busy preparing for nationalization. I don't believe it. Then what do you believe? That a feud between two powerful men dragged in their wives and son. Sounds a bit Jacobean, I have to admit. Oh, oh, oh careful. Uh, uh, ooh. You know, I once wanted to be a barrister. Did you? Yes. I was about ten at the time. Where did you come across a barrister at the age of ten? Oh, my father was in the dock. I beg your pardon? Brawling with some tops during the general strike. Of course he got sent down. Sixty days. George was involved in the general strike. Other side, probably. Yes. Oh, the sidings must be beyond that tunnel. Come on. Given the complete lack of information they could extract from young Allardyce, the police had to let me go. <laughs> I'm hardly a novice at the law, and they were well aware that I could cause as big a stink for them as they could for me. So you weren't jealous of Ian Allardyce? Oh, I was jealous of anyone who so much as looked at Jennifer. But I didn't attack him. Or have him attacked, if that's your next question. Then why did you come here to see him? Because something else connects us. Somehow, he's a victim of his own passion, the same as I was. Are you a passionate man, Mackie? Uh, well, 
That's a strange question. No, I, I don't just mean love. I mean, in general, do you get excited about things? Do you lose yourself in them? I try to keep my feet on the ground, if that's what you mean. Uh -huh. Do you know, when I went for the law, I wanted to be the best barrister that ever stalked a courtroom. I wanted juries hanging on my every word, witnesses jolted into total recall. The guilty blurting out spontaneous confessions. You are young. Yes. And I wanted to be a criminal lawyer, you see. But then I looked around. Top criminal barristers, throw a stick and you'd hit six. So I thought, divorce. More divorces every day. And the money. Oh, you wouldn't believe the money to be made. But you lost your true passion. Is that what you mean? Yes. I'd become a feet-on-the-ground sort of person. Like you. And that's a bad thing? Yes. Lose yourself, Mackie. A man has to be able to lose himself. If not, he's lost. <laughs> As it were. Ten o'clock and as breathless as noon. Mm. Regret, you know, is a luxury. And not one I've been able to afford. I don't know how to do anything else except detection. You have a private life, though. Of sorts. Then, if you fall in love, make sure it's with someone suitable. And don't hold back. Goodbye. Where are you going? At home? No, I, I think I'll sleep at the chambers tonight. Lot to do. I'm packing up as a lawyer, Mackie. Backing up. You know, I can never see a railway track without feeling vaguely nostalgic. Me too. You mean waving to engine drivers as a child? No. Looking for the best places to stick explosives. <laughs> and to think that now people are going to France for the food. Still, it's cool in this tunnel. Perhaps we should set up office here. Not impossible. The line is disused. Look at the rust on the rail. Not travelled since the war. That would explain its absence from the map. It probably led to a munitions depot. And what's the significance of that? No idea. The buildings would be empty by now anyway. Susan? Yes? Yeah? What do you think happens to the chairman of industries that are nationalised? I'm not sure. More. Go on. Stand still a moment. Why? Will it help you answer the question? No. Listen. It's the rails. Yes, but this line isn't used. You saw I it. know. I think someone's decided to put it back into service. We should get out of here. We're almost in the middle. There's no room to either side of the track. Backwards or, or, or forward? Forward. Oh. We'll never make it to the end, so forwards. There must be a recess. A, what? a workman's recess. They have to have one if they're working on the line. But where? Oh, I can't see a thing. Not on this side. Susan. Yes. It's over there. Across the track. Hurry. We must have one. went on and on and on, just inches away from our faces. I've never been so frightened in my life. Wagon after wagon, carriage after carriage, all empty. Sounds like a ghost train. Except we were very nearly the ghosts. Yeah. Hot sweet tea. Though it isn't sweet, the sugar rations run out. Thank you, Susan. And the driver? The cab was dimly lit, but we could hardly miss his face as we crossed the track three feet in front of him. He was the same man as in the photographs, running away from Ian Allardyce's flat. So where does that leave us? We've got more connections than Clapham Junction, but no idea where we're going. We saw the train slow and pull into the sidings. I suppose, theoretically, it could have been a shunting operation, even on a disused line. Yes, but mixed rolling stock, carriages and wagons, that's unusual. Tell us about D'Souza, Bill. Not a lot to tell. He'd come to the hospital to try and pay his respects. Which seems decent enough under the circumstances. I think we should return the compliment. To D'Souza? All of us? No. 
because the other mystery is why Ian Allardyce isn't talking. What has he got to hide? And come to that, where would he hide it? Precisely. Terrace door, padlocked. By the police, no doubt, to protect the scene of the crime. The penalty for breaking and entering a crime scene being... I think we'd be looking at an agency called simply Daunt for the next couple of years. Marvellous. Skeleton keys? Tire lever, easier to justify. If you have a car. What about the neighbours? Did they spot our engine-driving friend make his way out after the assault? No, they did not. Bank holiday weekend in Knightsbridge. They'll all be in coma. Oh, there we go. After you. Thanks. Well? Much the same as when Josephine and I were here. Some signs of a struggle, but... What on earth is this? What? This painting... Woman's got both eyes on the same side of her nose. Ironically enough, a fate which all but befell the artist. It's modern, Bill. In fact, on closer inspection, it's Jennifer D'Souza. I trust she's more attractive in the flesh. Certainly less angular. But she wasn't lying. There is a portrait. So it seems. In fact, at least one. What's that? The front door. They can't have discharged young Allardyce already, can they? Oh, for goodness sakes, stop complaining. That's Jennifer D'Souza. Should not be. The department's more busy than tricky enough already. And Sir Bernard. <gasps> I think the patio calls once again, Susan. But, Mr. D'Souza, aren't you being a little previous, packing up and leaving chambers, if the police have released you? Well, for the moment, anyway, the police are the least of my problems. Uh, Jennifer told you I was a violent man, didn't she? She implied as much. It's a lie. It's quite simply a lie. Here, look at this. Is that your wedding day? You, you seem very happy. I do, yes. Oh, let me be clear, Mrs. Daunt. When a successful man marries a woman who's the best part of 20 years younger than he is, he should have no illusions... I somehow knew that despite what I could lavish on her, it wouldn't last. I employed you because I needed to know. Now, whether she was actually betraying me or not, the publicity will make me a laughing stock. The man who pulls other people's marriages apart but can't keep a tag on his own. Possibly. But, um... Do I understand that Jennifer has no financial assets? Well, naturally, I don't restrict her to mere pocket money. She shops fairly liberally, insofar as one can these days. And lately, I think she's been investing in shares. Really? What sort of shares? I don't know. I didn't like to ask. It seemed like a bad omen. Well, as though she was trying to build up some capital before leaving me. Hmm. Mr. D'Souza, when you acted against Sir Bernard Allardyce, you must have done some research on him. Of course. I'm most thorough about that. Right. So what happens when Southern Railways is nationalised? Will he lose his job? Probably not. What about his shares in the company? They'll be bought by the government. Yes, of course. But at what value? Well, that depends on the state of the company's assets at the date of nationalisation. Why is this important? Just bear with me. What assets does the company have? Well, its buildings are probably leased. So it's the rolling stock, mainly. The rolling stock? Oh, Mrs. Daunt, this is a painful time for me. I don't want to talk about railways. I can understand that. Nonetheless, I do have a final question. When did you last meet Sir Bernard Allardyce? Bloody way to live. Never approved of it. If you have the guts to go into industry or commerce. Your relationship with Ian is hardly important at the moment. Just keep looking. What do you think they're after? I don't know, but they're certainly giving the studio a good going over. Anyway, how do we know it's here? Where else would he have hidden it? What do you mean here half a dozen times without turning it up? Because he wouldn't leave me for a moment. Couldn't take his eyes off me. 
Hey, you see what I mean? Worthless, these artists. No, no. Who on earth is that? Uh, it'll be Baxter. I told him I'd be here. Hello. Yes, yes, it's me. Who else would it be? Baxter. Do you think that's the engine driver? Could be. There's what? Oh, for God's sake. What is it? What? Shift the blasted thing. What's gone wrong? You'll have to. Oh, that's all I need. Calm down. What's the problem? There's been a points failure. The rolling stock's on the wrong side of the main line, and being bank holiday, there's extra trains. Then we need to get down there. Come on, we'll take the car. I thought you wanted to find that damn list. If those wagons are discovered in the wrong place, the list is neither here nor there. We're sunk. Now, come on. What do you think all that was about? Not the foggiest. But if it's a list thereafter, I've got a good idea where to look. Really? Where? That portrait of Jennifer. There was another canvas underneath, which means there's a gap between the two. Of course, Allardyce wasn't in his office on Bank Holiday Monday. And anyway, I don't see what you're driving at. Look, I may be wrong, but you've locked horns with Sir Bernard, and you know what he's capable of. Not really. I told you, his wife won the divorce for unreasonable behaviour. I haven't come across him since. Which reinforces my impression that Jennifer has been seeing him in secret. You what? Who was she having the affair with? The father, the son, or both? Probably neither, though I can't be certain of that. But my feeling is that with Sir Bernard, it's more of a financial arrangement. Yeah, how do you mean? Uh, Mrs. Dawn? I just want to buy a newspaper. Oh, please do. Take your time. Personally, I can believe it's hot without having it confirmed in print. It's not the weather report I intend to look at, Mr. D'Souza. <laughs> Typical bank holiday Monday. Every crossroads you come to, there's a traffic jam. You know what the Germans have got? Autobahns, they call them. May have lost the war, but they can move around their own country. <clears throat> Where are Chipshead sidings? Uh, about a mile up ahead. I'll get out here and walk the rest. <laughs> Keep the change. Your wife had no money of her own, Mr. D'Souza, and no grounds to divorce you. Even if she goaded you into divorcing her, she'd hardly gain anything in the settlement. So, as you said, she tries playing the stock market. But how quickly is that going to build up your fortune? Unless you're very lucky, or else you find a way of cheating. Cheating? Well, this is pure speculation. But I know for a fact that clandestine rolling stock movements are taking place, in addition to which... Look at the financial page. Southern Railway's share price. It's gone up. And by the look of things, it's been going up for a while. Now... Josephine! Bill! What are you doing here? Oh, good, a reunion. We found a full list of rolling stock movements. Susan's on the tail of Jennifer and Sir Bernard. I've been checking on points failures. Would somebody mind explaining? Points failures? There was one, but it's cleared now. I said... One moment, Mr. D'Souza. Uh, Chipstead! Chipstead! That's our train. Oh. Chipstead sidings. Last used circa 1945 and now, miraculously, full of rolling stock. But we can't move it across the main line. Huh? Why not? You're the head of the company, aren't you? You ought to be able to do anything you want. There are fixed schedules, woman! Then change them! These wagons have to be back in their proper position by the time the inspectors arrive. You think I don't know that? But there'll only be ten minutes to cross the line and I'm not willing to risk human life! Points are clear. I'm ready to go. Baxter! I forbid you to move that train! Ten minutes is plenty. Baxter, do you want to earn a hundred pounds? A hundred quid? You bet I do. Then help me onto the footplate. Jennifer, you can't! Oh, I do like to leave the Shares in all the railway companies are declining prior to nationalisation. All except Southern, because someone's buying into them in a big way. That's Jennifer, but not with the money you've given her. 
She's a conduit for Sir Bernard's cash. But why? Because they're moving the rolling stock around the region, counting and recounting it over and over again. Government compensation will be far higher than it should be. If those wagons are found in the wrong place, we're sunk. That's what Jennifer said. Of course. They've got one tame inspector on their side, but not all of them. My Jennifer. She's a clever and determined woman. In other circumstances, I'd say you were a lucky man. Jennifer! For God's sake, woman! This is suicide and, and not just yours! Sir Bernard! Sir Bernard! What? Where did you spring from? Never mind that now. Are those two trying to take the train across the main line? Yes. How did you know? They'll never make it, will they? Of course they won't. Look, look, who the hell are you? My name is Susan Dervish. Let me think. There's no plastic time to think. There'll be a major disaster. Jennifer will go to prison. I'm afraid that seems unavoidable. It's a fraud. Rather a daring one, I have to admit. But, Bill, you say a point failure delayed the latest rolling stock movements. Apparently so. Then I wonder if we shouldn't make our way towards the driver. That's not going to be easy in this crowd. And what for? Well, if they're still moving wagons at this time of day... What if Baxter spots the Brighton train? Will he be able to stop in time? Not a chance. There's no way of stopping an engine that quickly, even travelling at slow speed. Well, actually, there is, you know. Look, don't try telling me anything about railways. I've been working in them all my life. And I've had some experience with railways myself. What do you mean by that? This site would have been a munitions depot once, wouldn't it? Yeah, I think so. Why? I wonder if there are any little leftovers. <laughs> That's the brass! <laughs> Look, they are out of the window. There's another train heading this way. We're going to converge onto the same line. Yes, except... Isn't that Susan? By the tracks up ahead. So it is. What's she doing? Quite like the old days. <clears throat> except we used to get a little more... Preparation time. Uh, uh, three, two, one, and... Amazing you could do that with just a detonator. Lucky to have that. It was all that was left in the munitions depot. And neither Jennifer nor Baxter were badly hot. I'm not a complete novice at that sort of thing, you know. They'll face justice along with Sir Bernard. But why did Ian Allardyce steal the list of rolling stock movements in the first place? He hated his father and wanted something to hold over him. What he didn't realise at first is that Jennifer was in league with Sir Bernard. When he did, he simply hid the list away. And he wouldn't speak to the police for fear of dragging Jennifer into it. He obviously really was in love with her. And the whole portrait business was just a ruse on Jennifer's part to gain access to his flat and get the list back. What Ian didn't anticipate was when she failed, his father would be so desperate that he'd have his own son beaten up. Uh, he'll recover from his injuries anyway. Although the broken heart might take longer. Ditto for Philip de Souza. Who'll no doubt practice again. Perhaps with more humility. Ah, the charms that women weave. Do we? I'd say so. In any case, an eventful bank holiday weekend. With something of a traditional ending. Next year, why don't we really shut up shop and go away? To Cromer, I take it. In episode three of Daunt and Dervish by Guy Meredith, Josephine Daunt was played by Anna Massey and Susan Dervish by Francis Barber. Bill Mackey by Sean Scanlon and Philip D'Souza by Michael N. Harbour. Jennifer D'Souza, Tracy Wiles and Sir Bernard Allardyce, Ewan Bailey. Inspector Blakemore, Kim Wall and Dr. Phelps, Thomas Wheatley. The director was Colin Guthrie. Autobahns. Yes, that's what we need. Lots to learn from those krauts. I know that's not a view many people would agree with, but you watch. They'll be up and running before you know it. Oh, yes. I reckon they've got a few surprises in store for us. Where did you say you wanted to go? The law courts. Well, if we can get there in this traffic, probably breeze across Berlin.
May Gray's investigations of the attempted suicide of the glamorous Countess Pavarini and the death of her multimillionaire lover, David Ward, in the luxury hotel George V, take him behind the glittering facade of the world-famous hotels in Paris, Monte Carlo and Lausanne and into the private, often bewildering, world of the very rich. The Afternoon Play May Gray and the Millionaires by Georges Simenon, translated by Jean Stewart and dramatised for radio by Malcolm Stewart. With Maurice Denham as Superintendent May Gray, Brian Haynes as Inspector Luca, John Rye as Inspector La Pointe, Andrew Sachs as Mr. Arnold, Jane Wenham as the Countess, and David March as Van Merlin. May Gray and the Millionaires. The yellow? Well, that's room service. Where's Jules? Oh, just coming. Jules? Yes, what is it? Yellow's flashing. At this hour of the morning? What number? Uh, 332. 332? Oh, uh, all right, I, uh, I'll see to it. Who's in 332? The Comtesse Pavarini. The little Comtesse? That's what they call her. Did you notice the change in Jules when you gave him her room number? Oh, she's very popular with the old boys. It's her childish quality. She's had that suite for over a year, and I'm pretty sure she doesn't pay for it. Who does, then? The English Colonel at 347. He can mm. afford to. They say he's a millionaire several times over. <laughs> Colonel Ward. Didn't you all take a bottle of champagne along to them about an hour ago? Yeah. Champagne for her, a bottle of whiskey for him, in her suite. It's the same every night. Regular as clockwork. Madame la Comtesse. Madame la Comtesse. Oh. Madame la Comtesse. Who, who is it? The floor waiter, Madame la Comtesse. Oh, sure. Sure, I'm so frightened of. I think I, I'm, I'm dying. Sure, you please call a doctor. At once, Madame. I'll, I'll get the nurse no, to see you straight away. Oh, don't leave me. Not for a moment, uh, Madame. Uh, hello? This is Jules speaking, Suite 332. Put me through to the duty nurse, and please hurry. Is this the patient? Yes. She's a bit confused. Says she's taken poison. Poison? Have you any idea what... Oh, wait a minute. What's this? Yes, I thought so. Ring the switchboard from the sitting room and tell them to contact Dr. Frere. It's urgent. And bring me some hot water. Uh, very well. How are you feeling, my dear? Oh, it's the nurse. I've come to look after you. Oh, don't let me die. No, he won't let you die. The uh, doctor's on his way. How many tablets did you swallow? I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I can't remember. Never mind. Just relax. I'll give you something oh. to drink in a moment. Barbiturates. God knows how many she'd taken. The nurse gave her something to make her vomit. Mm. When the doctor arrived, he called the ambulance straight away. Where are they taking her? The American hospital, no. Is she going to die? I don't suppose so. They'll stomach pump her. The doctor gave her a shot of something before he took her off. What's it all about? Some sort of quarrel, perhaps. You know what these people are like. Lots of money, mm. living for pleasure. She and the colonel seemed quite happy an hour before when I took them up their drinks. Was he with her? No. Gone back to his own suite, I should imagine. They say he's going to marry her when his divorce comes through. Oh, if it's true, it'll be his fourth. And he's old enough to be our father. <laughs> oh, well, that's their affair. 
As far as I'm concerned, I've had enough for one night. Good morning, George. Hotel George Sank, good morning. This is John Arnold speaking. Ah, yes, uh, Mr. Arnold. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. I've been ringing Colonel Ward at intervals since you last phoned. No answer? Uh, no, I'm afraid not. Uh, he hasn't rung for his breakfast, apparently, and he hasn't gone out. I'll send someone up to his room immediately. He always expects a call from me at ten o'clock. This time it's very important. I'll do that right away, Mr. Arnold. Colonel Ward? <sighs> Colonel Ward? Colonel Ward? Are you there, Colonel? Colonel Ward? Oh, my God. Good morning, Luca. Good morning, Chief. jean the Lapointe. Chief, sir. Anything to report? Nothing exceptional. A fight on the Rue de Pontier, arrest for soliciting and drunkenness, an attempted suicide. It's all on your desk. All right. Inspector Luca. Very good, sir. I'll tell you. Straight away. That was the director. Wants to see you at once. Oh, I'm on my way. Are you wanted to see me, sir? Ah, Major, yes, come in. Uh, sit down. Thank you. Uh, may I... Um... Yes, yes, smoke your pipe by all means. Thank you, sir. Oh, that robbery with violence report will be on your desk within the hour. I'm afraid that'll have to wait. Something's come up. Sir? Mm. Rather pressing matter. You've heard of uh, Colonel Ward, the international financier? An Englishman. That's right. Lives at the Hotel Georges Sank. Yeah, gets quite a lot of coverage in the press because of his financial transactions and his marriage. Mm, that's the one. Well, he's just been found dead in his bath. The hotel manager panicked and got straight on to me. It's understandable. Ward had big financial interests. His death will upset the international markets, especially if it turns out to be murder. Mm. Was it murder? Mm, that's what I want you to find out. A great tact. Discretion is required. Oil the wheels as much as possible. And for God's sake, keep the press out of it. Oh, it's rather like asking the mice to stay away from the cheese. <laughs> well, do your best. I'm asking you to drop everything else because this case requires expert handling. I've already informed the hotel manager, Monsieur Gilles, that you're on your way. I think you know him. Yeah, I've had dealings with him in the past. Well, very good, sir. I'll get on with it. Thank you, Superintendent. Now, as always, you have my fullest confidence. Luca? Chief? I'm going out on an urgent case. When you see him, tell Jean Vier to go through to my office and work on that robbery with violence report. Lapointe? Sir? You come with me. If anyone asks for me, Luca, I'm at the Hotel Jean Sank. Is it about suicide? Suicide. The uh, attempted suicide. The Comtesse. What are you talking about? Well, there was something in the report this morning about a countess with an Italian name who tried to commit suicide at the George Sank. Where's the report? Here. It seemed a run of the mill affair. Somebody from the 8th arrondissement went to the New York Hospital and checked. They said she was out of danger. Well, has anyone been able to question her? I don't know. I'll just get over to the hospital and see what I can find out myself. All right. Come on, Lapont. Yes, Chief. Come in. Oh, excuse me. Is this Colonel Ward's, uh, the late Colonel Ward, sweet? Ah, Superintendent Maigret, uh, I am Gilles, the manager. We have met before. Oh, yes, indeed. Uh, this is my assistant, Detective Sergeant Lapointe. How do you do, sir? Come in, please. Uh, uh, this is Dr. Frere, who looks after the hotel guests. Doctor. Superintendent. I take it you've confirmed the death? Oh, yeah. Have you any idea when? Sometime during the early hours of this morning, I should imagine. Mm. Only a post-mortem can establish that accurately. May I see the body? Yes, the uh, the bathrooms through the bedroom. Uh, wait here, Lebrant. Yes, sir. In here. Oh, thank you. Oh. Yes, I'm afraid a body in the bath is not the most dignified of spectacles. Mm. Could it have been an accident? It might have been. 
They occur more frequently in baths than one expects. One slip, the head comes up against the rim of the bath. But that doesn't account for the marks left on the shoulders. Hmm? Oh, bruises. You believe someone helped him on his way? I'd rather leave that to the pathologist. When did you last see the Colonel alive? About a week ago, when I came to give the Countess her injection. Oh, a Countess with an Italian name? Mm, Pavarini. The one who tried to commit suicide last night? I'm not sure that her attempt was a serious one. She had undoubtedly taken a certain amount of phenobarbitone, but I doubt whether she swallowed enough to prove fatal. A phony suicide? Mm, possibly. Look, um, shall we go back to the sitting room? Hmm? Oh, yes. You say the Colonel was present when you gave the Countess her injection? Yes, I used to give her two a week. Vitamins B and C, all quite innocuous. Mm. What impression did you get of the relationship between her and Colonel Ward? Hmm? Well, I think that Monsieur Gilles could probably throw more light on that. Uh, um, the Colonel and the Countess were close friends. They had separate suites, but... Uh, uh, he was her lover? <laughs> The colonel had asked his wife to divorce him. His third wife? Oh, that's right. Everyone in there said expected that he would marry the countess as soon as he was free. Ah, oh, that could be for me answered, will you, LaPont? Yes, sir. Hello? Yes, hold on. There's a Mr. John Arnold in reception. He wants to come up. Mr. John Arnold? Uh, the colonel's confidential advisor. It was his attempt to get through to the colonel this morning that led to the discovery. Yes, all right, LaPont. Tell them he can come up. And Luca is on the line. It's urgent, apparently. Well, I'll take it. Would you tell Mr. Arnold that he can come up and would you put that call through, please? Here you are, sir. Hello, Luca. Yes? Yes? What? <laughs> well, all right. Put out a call and description to all airports and rail terminals. I want a round-the-clock watch. And keep me informed of any developments. Yeah, all right. You see to it. Well, Doctor, that was one of my inspectors. He's just been checking at the American hospital about the Countess Pavarini. Oh, yes? Now, do you think it possible, Doctor, that if the Countess had taken a dose of barbiturates large enough to kill her, she would have been able, after your treatment, to get up unaided about half an hour ago and leave the hospital? What? Is Monsieur Gilles here? Ah, uh, Mr. Arnold. So I understand, Monsieur Gilles, that uh, Colonel Ward... Um... Colonel Ward's body is in the bathroom. May I go through? Uh, um, uh, um, Superintendent. No, that's all right. Superintendent, you, you mm. say the Countess left the American hospital half an hour ago? Yes, apparently on her own initiative without telling anyone. Have they any idea where she can have gone? Mm, well, apparently not, and since she's not come back here, I suspect her intention is to leave Paris. That's why I've ordered a watch on all airports and rail terminals. Have you any idea? Mm, I'm afraid not. Thank you, Monsieur Gilles. <laughs> Oh, poor David. <laughs> Stupid accident, I suppose. Uh, well, that, I'm afraid, is by no means certain. No? Uh, to whom have I the pleasure of... Uh, this is Superintendent Maigret of the Police Judiciaire. I see. I think you know, Dr. Frere. Indeed. Yes. Um, Superintendent, I have a rather full day, if you don't require me any longer. Mm. Oh, my well. secretary knows all my movements, and the hotel has my telephone number. Very well, Doctor. Thank you for your help. Good day, gentlemen. Good day, Good day. Good day Doctor. Mr. Arnold, may I ask who you are and why you come here this morning? Why? <coughs> um, Mr. Arnold is an important... Let uh, him speak for himself, please. Well, if you're going to interrogate me, I wonder if we could do it in comfort. Do you mind if I sit down? No, please do. With your permission, Superintendent, there Hello. are certain matters downstairs which yes. I have to supervise. Oh, um, of course. Chief, it's a public prosecutor for you. Oh, thank you. There's Superintendent Megre here. Yeah? Yes, I am in suite 347 at the Hotel Georges Sack. Well, yes, a dead man in the bath, yes, Colonel David yes, Ward. Of course, well, certain signs do suggest that the death was not an accident. Ah, a very important man, yes, I do realise that. Well, thank you, Monsieur Le Procureur. We'll be expecting you. Goodbye. Um, uh, Superintendent. Yes? I... <laughs> If you're expecting a number of people, do you think I might get them to use this service door? Mm. If, if there's too much coming and going in the entrance hall... I... Yeah, it creates gossip. <laughs> By all means, Monsieur Gilles. <laughs> Thank you, Superintendent. Uh, oh, uh, excuse me, gentlemen. Yes. 
Well, I apologize for these interruptions, Mr. Arnold. You were saying... I was simply trying to make it clear that my friend David Ward was an extremely wealthy man of considerable influence. Financially, he was of international significance. Uh, quite. How old was he? Uh, 63. And you were his confidential advisor? His friend. And business advisor. His friend, primarily. Are you staying here? Uh, no, no. At the Hotel Scribe. Here, as elsewhere, we almost always lived in separate hotels. David guarded his privacy most jealously. Is that the reason the Countess Pavarini had a suite at the further end of the corridor? That was a um, question of discretion. But didn't everyone know about their relationship? People may have gossiped. Or was it true? I suppose so. I never asked. And yet you were his intimate friend? Certainly. But there are limits of tact and decency, even in friendship. How many wives did the colonel have? Uh, three. The, the reason he had such a reputation with the ladies was the press's habit of speculating on another marriage every time he was seen in public with a different woman. Mm, are all his wives still living? Yes. How are they situated financially? Oh, they're well provided for. And Countess Pavarini? I've no doubt he would have married her once his divorce with Muriel Halligan had been finalised. Uh, Muriel Halligan, his present wife? Yes. Did he have any enemies? Not to my knowledge. No one had anything to gain by his death. To gain? I ask you advisedly, who stood to gain by his death? No one. Oh, thank you, Mr. Arnold. That'll be all for the moment. Now, the public prosecutor may wish to see you when he arrives. Well, I shall be in the hotel. Uh, Mrs. Gilles will know where to find me. Hmm? No, I shall be in the small bar. I trust that is acceptable, Superintendent. Oh, certainly. Yes, thank you. Oh, um... The one thing I would ask is that you avoid too much talk getting around about this affair. <sighs> yes. David was, um, Colonel Ward was an important man. His death will have repercussions, not only on the stock exchange, but in other circles as well. We shall be as discreet as possible. Yes, thank you. Good morning, gentlemen. Morning. Uh, Laporte. Chief. Well, you'd better ring the K, get the technical chaps along, fingerprints, photographs, the works. Oh, and the pathologist, Dr. Pole, of course. Right, Chief. In the meantime, I'll have a look round the suite. And somehow I don't think I'm going to find anything that's going to help us. Please go in, gentlemen. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. I think you know Superintendent Maigret, Monsieur the Procureur. Indeed. Good morning. Uh, Superintendent, this is Monsieur Kalla, the examining magistrate appointed to this investigation. How do you do, sir? Superintendent. Well, Superintendent... Have you any ideas? Well, not at the moment, I'm afraid. I've had a look round the suite, but nothing of any obvious help. We had a call from Inspector Luca of your office about a Countess Paberini. She appears to have been Ward's mistress. Now, I gather she tried to commit suicide last night. Uh, that's correct. Now, she's disappeared from the hospital. Uh, well, I've had a watch put on all airport stations and other outlets for Paris. Uh, a discreet watch, I trust. I... Uh, yes. Oh, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, Dr. Powell, police pathologist. Ah, Maigret. Dr. Powell, good to see you. Uh, Monsieur le Procureur and the examining magistrate. Gentlemen, oh, uh, what's going on with the hotel staff, Maigret? I actually hmm? thought they were going to send me in by the tradesman's entrance. <laughs> yeah. That's what's happening to your technical people. Oh, uh, don't close the door. Hmm. They'll be up here in a minute. Le Pointe, see to the photographer and the fingerprint experts when they appear. Very good, Chief. Now, to business. Uh, where's the body? In the bathroom, uh, through the bedroom there. Thanks. Man or woman? Uh, oh. Oh, that sounds like our technical chaps now, Lapointe. Yes. May we come in? Yes, come in, Inspector. Sergeant Lapointe will show you and your men round. Uh, start with the bedroom. Very well. This way, Inspector. Thank you. Uh, can we open the window shutters, get some more light in here? Is that all right, Superintendent? Yes, certainly. Yes, sir. Mr. Kalla, I presume you want the usual list of personal articles found in the suite? Uh, yes, indeed. In fact, if you'll excuse me, Monsieur Le Procureur, mm -hmm. I think I'd better go through to the bedroom now to make sure. Oh, yes, yes, of course, Kalla. Uh, <sighs> what a I business it all is. is. Mm. Yeah, you know, we shall see whether Dr. Powell confirms Dr. Frere's opinion. According to him, the bruises. Yes. Well, take that, will you, Lapointe? There's a phone by the bed. Very good, Chief. Now, according to Dr. Frere, the bruises seem inflicted rather than accidental. Oh, indeed. It's too class, Superintendent. Hmm? He wants a word with you. Oh, all right. Excuse me, sir. Oh, yeah. Yes, Luca? Chief, I've just found out something. 
Huh? Countess Pavarini made several phone calls from her hospital room about nine o'clock this morning. Oh, did they note the numbers? Not the local calls, but she also rang Monte Carlo, the Hotel de Paris. Who did she speak to? They don't know. Well, see if you can find out. I'll ring back. Very good, Chief. All right, send the photographs to me at the Medico Legal Institute. Very well, Dr. Powell. Well, gentlemen, I can now give you my initial findings. Uh, mm. Is the examining magistrate here? Uh, yes, Doctor. Ah, well, uh, pending my report and the post-mortem, for I assume one will be ordered, I can tell you this. First, that fellow was built to last until at least 80. Oh. Secondly, he was pretty drunk when he got into his bath. Thirdly, he didn't slip. Ah. And the person who helped him meet his end had to use a certain amount of force to hold him under the water. Mm, Dr. Powell, do you think a woman could have done that? Well, it depends on the woman. Well, she's generally known as the Little Countess, which suggests that she's of slight build. Oh, it's not size or weight that counts. Uh, anyway, if you'll have the body dispatched to the Medico Legal Institute, I'll try to find out what I can. Yes. Uh, now, gentlemen, if you'll excuse me. Uh, thank you, Dr. Powell. Gentlemen. Uh, Colonel, what hmm? about this post-mortem? Do you think it should be held? Perhaps we'd better postpone it for a day or two. Yes, there's always the chance of fresh evidence. Well, in that case, it might be as well for us to cast an eye over 332. 332? Uh, Countess Pavarini, sweet. Ah. Uh, shall I lead the way? As you can see, a profusion of everything, all top quality. Masses of lingerie, cupboards full of dresses... Twenty-eight pairs of shoes have counted, and a lot of them new. Yes, I, I must confess I have few qualms about having a man's belongings searched. But a woman's was well, different somehow. Yeah, that's because you're a gentleman, Monsieur Le Procureur. I'm a mere policeman. Well, we must all do our duty, whatever we are. The atmosphere certainly reeks of perfume and alcohol. No, well, it's the hallmark of a certain class. Their values are quite different to ours. But look at these jewels, strewn about the rising table as if they were things of no value. Diamond bracelet, watch, rings, earrings. Luxury articles only to be found in special shops. They must be worth a small fortune. I must confess, I felt rather the same going through the Colonel's effects. Mm. A bedside clock from Cartier's made of gold. A gold cigar case. A manicure set from some mm. London firm. And at least 18 suits hanging in the cupboard. And you'd find the same in his other hotel suites. Cannes, Lausanne, London. Oh, it's a different world. Uh, well, Mayor Grey, we must leave all this to you. Uh, see to it with discretion, hmm? And above all, keep the press out where you can. I will certainly do my best, Monsieur Le Procureur. Come in. Ah, yes, La Pointe, what is it? Uh, the phone call you wanted traced, Chief. Mm. Lucar got through to the Hotel de Paris Monte Carlo. The telephonist there had more than 15 calls from Paris this morning and can't say who this one was intended for. All right, La Pointe, thank you. Now, I want lists made of the contents of this suite, all the Countess's effects. And all the valuables will have to be noted and handed over to the management for safekeeping. Yes, very good, Chief. You'll better contact Monsieur Gilles. Is he still in the Colonel's suite? Yes, he is. Supervising the removal of the body. Uh, right. Discreetly, I trust. They're taking it away through the service door. Uh, down the back stairs, presumably. Yes, well, that will prevent gossip. Uh, well, let us hope so. Uh, we must be going. Uh, goodbye, uh, Maigret, and thank you. We shall be hearing from you. Oh, yes, indeed, Monsieur Le Procureur. Uh, goodbye, Monsieur Kala. Uh, goodbye, Superintendent. Now to this <laughs> Well, well. Multimillionaire built to last till 80, going out by the back stairs. Uh, Mr. Arnold? Hmm? Oh, uh, Superintendent. Yeah, there are one or two more questions I'd like to ask you. If you must. Well, can you think of anyone living at the Hotel de Paris Monte Carlo? Whom Countess Pavarini might have telephoned under the present circumstances? Oh, certainly. Jeff van Merlin. Jeff van Merlin? Her second husband. Ah. Yes, owns the Belgian chemical firm. He's got a villa at Mougines near Cannes, but uh, most of the time prefers to stay at the Hotel de Paris. And they kept on good terms? Excellent. And what about van Merlin and the Colonel? Uh, they were old friends. And Count Pavarini? Uh, a bit of an adventurer. No money. And they divorced? Yes. I see. Oh, just one more question. Who is the colonel's lawyer? Oh, good heavens, um, had a great many. Mm. In London, the solicitors Filthorpe and Hadley. In New York, Harrison and Shaw. In Lausanne... Yeah, but which of these firms do you think he entrusted his will? 
He left wills all over the place. He was always changing them. Oh, thank you, Mr. Arnold. I'll try not to bother you further. Oh, well, don't forget what I've told you. Mm. Be careful. We don't want trouble. Look, I never want trouble, Mr. Arnold, and I'm always careful. Excuse me. La Pointe? I brought the car around, Chief. It's by the entrance. Good. What news of the Countess? Well, according to Luca, she boarded a plane to Nice at 10.28 this morning. Did she? Hmm. Drive me to Orly as fast as you can. I'm going to follow our little Countess. Superintendent Baygray. Yes? I'm Inspector Benoit. Welcome to Nice. Thank you. In response to the inquiry we received from Orly, the lady in whom you're interested, uh, Countess Pavarini, arrived here about two hours ago. Mm -hmm. She left the airport, but returned just in time to catch the Swiss Air flight to Geneva. Uh, was she alone? No. She's accompanied by an important-looking gentleman who apparently had rung earlier to reserve a seat for her. Did he ring from the Hotel de Paris by any chance? I don't know. They can tell you in the office. Was his name Van Merlin? Van Merlin. That seems to ring a bell. This way, Superintendent. Monsieur Van Merlin is expecting you. Thank you. His suite is just along here. I'm Jean, Monsieur Van Merlin's personal assistant. I know he's looking forward to meeting you. He's followed some of your investigations with the greatest interest. Mm. Uh, by the way, he asks you to forgive him for receiving you while having his massage, but he has to go out immediately afterwards. Here we are. Please go in. Thank you. Superintendent Megre. Oh, come in, Superintendent. I'm in the bedroom having a massage. So oh, come in, take a chair, make yourself comfortable. Thank you. I'm sorry to deceive you like this, but I'm giving dinner for 20 at the sporting club this evening. Have you nearly finished, Robert? Uh, just about, monsieur. <laughs> uh, I expected a visit of some sort, but I imagined I would merely get a local inspector. <laughs> that you should have taken the trouble to come personally. Uh, thank you, Robert. Ah, uh, of course, I knew that you would pick up Louise's track, and I warned this morning on the phone not to try to hide. Uh, not that I really knew what had happened. She was much too frightened to give any details, almost incoherent. Your bathroom, monsieur. Thank you. Uh, same time tomorrow. Oh, no, wait a minute. I have an appointment. Uh, say four o'clock. Very good, monsieur. Do you know her? Uh, well, the Countess. Mm. I'm afraid not. Uh, she's a funny creature. One of the oddest and most engaging women in the world. Uh, will you excuse me if I take a shower? I'll leave the door open. We can go on talking. I uh, suppose you're in touch with Paris. What's the latest news? Well, the investigation's only just begun. No, I don't mean the police. What about the papers? Have they published anything yet? Not as far as I know. I wouldn't be surprised if one of the Philps brothers hadn't already taken a plane to Paris. A oh, Philps? The London lawyers? Yeah. Who could have given them the information? Arnold, of course. And as soon as the women get to know. Oh, you mean the Colonel's former wives? Well, they are the most interesting parties. Hmm. I don't know where Dorothy is, but Alice must be in Paris. And Muriel, who lives in Lausanne, will be aboard the first plane for Paris. Uh, where are the drinks, Jean? Just bringing them, Monsieur Van Merlin. A martini, Superintendent. Oh, thank you. Uh, leave mine on the bedside table. Yes, Monsieur. And, uh, will you look out my evening ties and dress cufflinks? Right away, Monsieur. <laughs> I must apologize for getting dressed like this while discussing such a serious matter, Monsieur Maigret. It's just that I'm a little pressed for time. No, I quite understand. See, David Ward was a good friend of mine. We'd known each other for over 30 years, and we were partners in a number of enterprises. The news of his death was a considerable shock, particularly a death of that sort. I can well believe it. <laughs> Are you planning to go to Lausanne to see the Countess? Mm, I may. I assume you know she's there. Huh? I sent her to the Lausanne Palace where she feels at home, not to hide from the police, but to save her from being beset 
by journalists and from all the complications that are bound to ensue. She'll be in a calmer frame of mind than she was this morning when she called me from Paris. She was talking so incoherently that I told her to get the first plane and come down to see me. Mm. How long were you married to her? For two and a half years. and We're still good friends. That's why she turned to me. I met her when she arrived at the airport. We had lunch in Nice. She told me everything. You... You don't suspect her of killing David, do you? Uh, look, that would be a mistake. To begin with, how certain are you that someone held David underwater in the bath? Who told you that? Louise, of course. Well, she saw him? She saw him, and she doesn't attempt to deny it. Listen, Superintendent. Even though she's nearly 40, Louise is still a child, and always will be. That's what gives her her special charm. And that's what makes her continually get herself into impossible situations. Your platinum cufflinks, monsieur. Oh, thank you, Jean. Uh, put them in for me, will you? Oh, certainly, monsieur. Louise was born in Morocco. Her father was a general, and her mother's family were provincial gentry. When she grew up, she persuaded her parents to let her go to Paris and study art. It was there she met this Italian... Count Marco Pavarini, and fell head over heels in love. He's a real count, but penniless. As far as I know, at that time he was living on the favours of a middle-aged lady. Monsieur. Thank you, Jean. Very good, monsieur. Louise eventually got her parents' consent for the marriage, but only after a great deal of persuasion. At first they had a flat in Passy then a room in an hotel, then another flat, various ups and downs. But they always managed to appear at the usual cocktail parties, receptions and entertainments. Did Pavarini make use of his wife? Not in the way you think. She was madly in love, and she would not have agreed to it anyway. I'm even convinced that Marco was in love with her, too. All the same, they were always quarrelling. Mm. She left him three or four times after violent scenes, but never for more than a few days. In any case, Marco had only to reappear looking pale and distraught for her to fall into his arms. Oh, what did they live on? Oh, don't ask me. What do so many of one's social acquaintances live on? Hmm? It was after one of those quarrels that I met her. They decided on a divorce, and I was sorry for her. I thought it was the wrong sort of life, that she was wearing herself out and would soon lose all her charm in the hands of a man like Marco. As I had recently been divorced, I asked her to marry me. I had a talk with Marco. I gave him a large check and told him to make himself scarce to South America. Did he go? Yes. I had certain means of... Uh, persuading him. I presume he'd done something unscrupulous. Possibly. Louise was my wife for three years. I travelled a great deal and she went everywhere with me. We were fairly happy. I believe she still is fond of me. She calls me daddy. <laughs> but that's understandable. After all, I am 30 years older than she is. Was it through you that she met David Ward? Yes, it was. But it wasn't David that took her away from me. It was Marco who came back one fine day, looking thin and miserable, and began hanging about, rather like a stray dog. Excuse me, I must finish dressing. Yes, yes, of course. Well, what was I to do? I offered to divorce her, and made it a modest allowance so that Marco shouldn't leave her penniless. I thought that better than giving her a specific sum. And then one day, David started divorce proceedings... And it was his turn to play the good Samaritan. But he didn't marry her. He didn't have time to. He died before the divorce was made absolute. I'm not sure what's going to happen now. If all the papers haven't been signed, Muriel Halligan may well be considered David's widow. Muriel Halligan. And that's the whole story? Well, not quite. There's what happened last night. Uh, what did happen? Uh, what did happen? Jean, uh, where are my evening ties? Coming, monsieur. Oh, yes, last night. 
Louise and David dined together in town. They went on to some nightclub. And there, quite by chance, they ran into Marco with a big Dutch blonde, very much of the smart set and extremely wealthy. They didn't speak, but Louise was on edge until they got back to the Georges V. They went up to her suite and she ordered champagne for herself and a bottle of scotch for David. They'd been drinking all evening, presumably. Oh, yes. Your ties, monsieur. Oh, good. Um, oh, this one, I think. Thank you, Jean. Monsieur? Uh, does the countess drink a lot? Yes, too much. And after a few drinks, she tends to develop a guilt complex and accuse herself of all imaginable sins. According to what she said today, she told David that she was unworthy of him. That she couldn't help running after Marco and begging him to take her back. Uh, what did Ward say? Nothing. I doubt whether he even understood. He'd be drinking since five o'clock, which was usual for him. He'd be all right until about one in the morning, but by two he'd be fuddled and incoherent. I've often thought he might have an accident when he took his bath in that condition. Mm. So they stayed up drinking together, and what happened then? I gather David went back to his suite. That was when Louise started fancying that she must have upset him, felt she must go and beg his pardon, which is quite in character. Uh, did she? Apparently. At least that was her intention. She went down the corridor in her nightdress, found the door ajar, went in and discovered, well, you know... She didn't call for help? No, she ran back to her room and flung herself on the bed. She told me at that point she really wanted to die. How many tablets did she take? I know what you're thinking. She wanted to die because that would have settled everything, but she wouldn't have minded going on living. And precisely. The fact remains that she rang the bell in time. You put yourself in her place. It was all a nightmare. When she recovered consciousness and found herself in the hospital, her first thought was to ring Marco, but she got no answer. So she rang me. And that's the full story? As far as I know. But if David was murdered, and I bow to your judgment, I swear it wasn't Louise who killed him. And I haven't the slightest idea who could have done it. And now I really must go. And I really mustn't keep you well, thank you for your cooperation, Monsieur Van Uden. Thank you for being so patient, Monsieur Maigret. It's been a pleasure meeting you. Uh, Jean, Monsieur. if anyone asks for me, I'm at the sporting club. Uh, what shall I do if it's New York? Oh, tell them I've thought it over and the answer is no. Uh, can I give you a lift anywhere, Monsieur Maigret? No, thank you, no. I have a call to make to my office in Paris. Uh, hello, uh, Maigret here. Is Luca there? Luca speaking, Chief. Ah, I'm calling from Monte Carlo. What news? You know it's all been leaked to the press. Oh, yes? Ward's English lawyer came over from London. He insisted on a personal interview with the director. They were closeted together for over an hour. Any reactions? Everyone's lips are sealed, except those of the press. Naturally. The journalists invaded the George Sank and the hotel detective had to throw them out. They're saying the Countess may have committed the crime and you're personally on her track. Ah, the usual guff. Is La Pointe busy? <sighs> no more than usual, Chief. Good. Now, get him to find and interview Count Marco Pavarini. Ask him when he last saw the Countess. What does he know of Ward's death? What was he doing when Ward was killed? That sort of thing. Very good. Uh, tell La Pointe it's urgent. Uh, any other developments... John Arnold rang up, furious about the press. Huh. We managed to calm him down. What are your plans, Chief? I'm staying here in Monte Carlo overnight. Tomorrow I'm flying to Lausanne. The Countess? All being well. Welcome to the Lausanne Palace, Superintendent. Uh, did you have a comfortable trip? Reasonably comfortable, thank you. Is uh, Countess Pavarini in her suite? Yes, indeed. I suppose she's not up yet. She rang for her breakfast half an hour ago. Shall I let her know that you're here? I think she's expecting you. Ah, that means someone's been on to her. Has she had any phone call? Yes, I checked as you asked. I have a record of them. Uh, she had a call from Monte Carlo at one o'clock this morning. May I see? Here you are. Thank you. 
Yes, Van Marlen. I see she rang Paris early this morning. Did she get an answer? Uh, oh, yes. Yeah, yes, she left a message to be rung back. Marco Pellerini. And she rang Monte Carlo about ten minutes ago, a six-minute call. Well, thank you. Uh, will you let her know I'm here? I'll go up. Certainly. Uh, pay no, th that's all right. I'll find my way. Well, thank you. They told me you were on your way up. Please sit down. I'll be with you directly. Mm. Oh. Oh, please don't get up. Please. Oh. I, I must apologise for receiving you in my dressing gown. Oh, I'm sorry to have put you to inconvenience, Countess. However, I understand you were expecting me. Uh, yes, Chef... Uh, uh, Monsieur Van Mullen told me that you had seen him. I'm sorry to have given you all this trouble. I shouldn't have run away. It's all been so unexpected. I... So... So horrible. Oh, forgive me, but David's death... Oh. And on, on the very day that... When you were going to tell Colonel Ward that you had decided to leave him? Was that what you were going to say? Yes. Are you going to take me back to Paris? Or does the prospect frighten you? I, I don't know. Chef advised me to go with you if that was what you wanted. I do whatever he tells me. He's a wonderful man, so kind, so, so intelligent. You feel he can foresee everything. Uh, he didn't foresee the death of his friend, Colonel Ward. No, no. But he foresaw I'd go back to Marco. That you'd go back? Mm. I thought you didn't speak to Count Paverini when you came face to face with him at the nightclub. No, that's true, but all the same, I'd made up my mind. No, I just can't explain it. Things were going so well, I, I thought I was cured of Marco. David and I were going to get married as soon as the final documents were signed. And you had no intention of breaking with the Colonel when you went out to dinner with him earlier that evening? No, no. All the same, I suspected it would happen one day. Why? Because it had happened before. You'd left the Colonel? Yes. For Marco? Yes. But it didn't work. I knew it wouldn't work this time. And yet you were prepared. Why didn't it work? Marco's got no money. And neither have I. I've nothing at all. If Jeff hadn't sent money to the bank this morning, the cheque I signed at the airport for my plane ticket would have bounced. He had to give me some money yesterday so that I could come here. I'm very poor. Mm, well, what about your jewellery? Oh, I have some jewellery, yes, yes. And, and my mink, but that's all. Mm. What arrangement was there between you and Colonel Ward? He didn't keep me, if that's what you mean. He paid my current expenses. But I never had any money in my bag. Well, come to that, David never had any money about him either. It was Arnold who paid all the bills at the end of the month. And now, oh, well, that's all come to an end, and I'm 39. Oh, forgive me. I, 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 I've got to... Um... Whiskey? Yes. Sometimes... Sometimes I can last for weeks without drinking, but when I get into the state I'm in now, I have to... And tell me more about Marco. Marco? <laughs> I hadn't decided anything. And when I saw him with that woman at the nightclub, it, it gave me a shock. Did you know her? Anna de Groot, yes. She is divorced. And her ex-husband had business dealings with David. I, I knew that she and Marco had had an affair at Deauville. Well, I'd even heard that she had decided to marry him. And you were determined to prevent that marriage? Yes. So it's Marco who should have been killed. What do you mean? Did the thought of killing him never occur to you? Did you never threaten to do so? How did you know that? Did Chef tell you? No. Oh... It wasn't like that. Oh. At the Monseigneur, I got very worked up. I, 
I, I, I wanted to make a scene, go and, and drag Marco away from that horrible woman. David insisted on our leaving. In the car, I never said a word. I, I planned to slip out of the hotel later on and go back to the nightclub. David must have guessed because he suggested that we should have a final drink in my suite. Did you tell him you intended to leave him? Oh, I told him everything. Mm. That I was just a bitch. That I'd, I'd never be happy without Marco. That Marco only had to appear for me. What did David say? He just went on quietly drinking his whiskey. Mm. Did anything happen between David and yourself? No, oh, you don't understand. Nothing ever happened. David had drunk a good deal, as he always did at bedtime. After he had gone, I, I just wanted to crumple up on my bed and stop thinking. I, I said to myself that it wouldn't work out with Marco, that it could never work out, that it would be better if I died. How many tablets did you take? No, I don't know. A handful. It made me feel better. I was... I was crying and I began to fall asleep and... Then I... I began imagining my funeral and the cemetery and I was afraid it was too late. I... I... I, I found I... I couldn't shout. The bell pushed seemed very far away. My arm was heavy just as in dreams when you're trying to run off. Why are you looking at me like that? Why are you lying to me? Lying? What about going to the Colonel's room? Isn't that what you told Van Merlin? Oh. Well, please, don't, don't be hard on me. I swear I didn't mean to deceive you. You see, it's always like that with me. I, I do what I can. I've got nothing to hide. And then, and then I end up losing my head. <laughs> I don't know what's happening to me. You went to the Colonel's room eventually. How long after he left you? I don't know. I remember I smoked several cigarettes. Life suddenly seemed to be terrifying. I saw myself as a lonely old woman. Without money. Incapable of earning a living. David was my last chance. I went in my nightgown. Without even a wrap. As, as far as his suite and I found the door ajar. Did you see anyone there? Only him. I nearly screamed. I'm not, not sure that I didn't scream. Then I ran back to my room. You met no one in the corridor? No, no, I heard the lift going up. That's when I began... Oh, excuse me. Uh, hello? Uh, yes, yes, he's here. Uh, it's for you. Oh, thank you. Excuse me, I... Hello? Chief, Luca here. Ah, I was going to call you shortly. I expected you would, but I thought I'd better put you in the picture at once. Marco Pavarini is here. You found him? He came of his own accord, turned up some 20 minutes ago and asked to see you. Mm. I saw him myself. He's in your office with Janvier at the moment. What did he say? That he only learned about the business through the papers. Last night? This morning. He was out of Paris, staying in the country with some friends who were having a shooting party. Did a Dutch lady go with him? Yes, Anna de Groot. They left in her car. Apparently, he saw his ex-wife with the colonel at the Monseigneur on the night of the murder. They didn't speak, and he went back with the Dutch woman to her place. Where? The Georges Sank. She's got a suite on the fourth floor. Has she? At what time was this? About half past three. They went to bed and didn't leave the suite until ten this morning, when he and his girlfriend drove off to the country in her car. But just before sitting out on the chute, he glanced at the papers saw the reports, and drove straight back to Paris. I've sent someone out to check up on all this, but they haven't come back yet. And what impression did he make on you? He was perfectly at ease. Quite a nice fellow, in fact. What do you want me to do? Uh, send Le Pointe to the Georges Sank. Let him investigate the comings and goings on the night of the murder and question the night staff. As for, my... As for your visitor, you can't do anything at this juncture. Let him go. Tell him not to leave Paris, but have someone keep an eye on him. I'll ring you back later. I understand. Goodbye, Chief. Goodbye. Was it him? Who? Marco. 
You were talking about him, weren't you? Yes. Are you sure you didn't meet him in the corridors of the George Sank? I night? knew it. It was there with her. Wasn't he just above my head? Oh, yes, I know. She always stayed at the George Sank. I, I found out where her rooms were. They, they were in bed together, laughing, making love. Are you not thinking, perhaps, that Marco was elsewhere doing something very different? Possibly in the bathroom of the Colonel's suite, holding his head under water. What? Are you mad? How dare you? You monster! Brute! Oh, brute! Stop oh, that! Brute! Stop it, I tell you. Stop it at oh. once! Oh. Let me go! Let me go! Yes, come in. Excuse me, monsieur. I've come to collect the breakfast tray. Oh. That'll be all right, Superintendent. I've had you booked on the four o'clock flight to Paris. Oh, good. You want to give yourself an hour for Geneva Airport. Uh, by the way, I gather the Countess is also booked on that flight. Oh, thank you, Monsieur Lily. Well, I shall have over three hours to cool my heels, get to know Lausanne rather better. Well, here, I think, is someone who will help you do that. Hmm? Chief Inspector Monjoie, Lausanne CID. What? A friend of yours, I believe. Oh, Monjoie, my dear fellow. I hardly recognize you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how long is it? Oh, nearly ten years, Maigret. Uh, it's good to see you. I was delighted to hear that you'd honor us with your presence. Uh, May I have the pleasure of entertaining you to lunch? Oh, you may indeed. There's nothing I'd like better. Well, there's a quiet little place by the lake. A few minutes' drive away. I've got a car waiting. Well, then let us proceed. <laughs> Thank you for your good offices, Monsieur Le Dier. My pleasure, Superintendent. Room number... It's a charming situation. Well, this wine is excellent. Oh, well, let me refill your glass. Oh, thank you. Now, you say the Countess is well known here. Hmm? Oh, yes. She spends part of each year in Lausanne. Uh, we knew Colonel Ward, too, and practically all the people you're concerned with. Oh, by the way, Ward's third wife left in a hurry this morning for Paris. Muriel Halligan. Uh, Muriel Ward. Uh, the divorce isn't absolute yet, and she still uses his name. What sort of a woman is she? An American woman. <laughs> you mean she's after the best term she can get for the settlement? Well, she chose the best lawyers in the country. You can imagine what that's costing. Apparently, her case is that since her husband has accustomed her to a certain standard of living, he must enable her to maintain it to the end of her days. I suppose that while the case is sub here, the wife is careful to avoid any indiscretion. Careful? Oh, yes. Uh, you... I have met Mr. John Arnold, I suppose. Oh, yes? Oh, he turned up at the George Tank before anyone else. He's a bachelor. Yes? At one time it was whispered he was homosexual. I know from the staff of hotels where he stays that this is not the case. What else do you know? Well, besides being the Colonel's business agent, he was also his confidant. Apart from his legal wives, the colonel used to have passing affairs with various women. As he was too lazy or found it embarrassing to make such casual propositions, Arnold sort of things for him. Ah, I see what you mean. Then you can guess the rest. Arnold took his commission in kind. It is also said he did so with Ward's legal wives. You're ill? Well, he has twice been to Lausanne to see her alone. Mm. The countess? Oh, undoubtedly. Did Ward know? I think Ward suspected a great deal, but didn't mind very much. Like his friend Van Merlin, whom you met in Monte Carlo, mm. neither expected from women more than they were likely to get. Uh. Well, I have a favour to ask of you, Monsieur. Oh, please. Well, I gather the Countess is planning to return to Paris by the same plane as myself. Uh, yes, I heard the hotel manager mentioning something of the kind. Mm, well, she's in a rather hysterical state at the moment. Well, understandably. But if she finds she's on the same plane as myself, especially with the press snooping, she's liable to create a scene. 
be much better if she could be persuaded to take the night train. Sleeping quietly in a coup shed by herself might help to soothe her nerves. <laughs> I follow. I think that could be arranged, my friend. I should be grateful. It will be done with the greatest tact and consideration. You have my word. Ah, here comes our main course, the house mm. speciality. You're going to enjoy this, and don't worry about the time. I'll have one of our cars run you to the airport. Maluka. Hello, Chief. Had a good drink? Not bad. What's the report? The point carried out a very detailed check on the night stuff at the George Sank, as you ordered. It's on your desk. Good. Apart from that? A lot of activity, endless comings and goings. Visits from all sorts of people, including De Monto, the lawyer. Phone calls to London, Amsterdam, Lausanne. Journalists in the hotel lobby wanting to know about the funeral, the will, everything. Mm, what about Arnold? Well, this morning he went to the Hotel Bristol and conferred for about an hour with Philp, the English solicitor who came over yesterday. Then they went to an American bank in the Avenue de l'Opera and a British bank in the Place Vendôme. Mm -hmm. In both, they were received by the manager and stayed for a longish time. Yes. When they separated, the solicitor took a taxi back to his hotel. And Arnold? He went to the Hotel des Grand Augustin at a quarter to one and was joined by Ward's wife. Muriel Halligan. Yes. Uh. Apparently, she'd arrived at Orly at half past eleven. Did they lunch together? Yes, in a little restaurant on the Rue Jacques, which looks like a bistro, but is very expensive. <laughs> they chatted like old friends, but uh, spoke too quietly to be overheard. <laughs> then Arnold took her back to her hotel and went off in a taxi to meet Philp again. Oh, thank you. Mm. You look tired, Chief. Oh, do I? Uh, shall we go for a quiet meal at the Brasserie Dauphine? That's a good idea. Oh, come on, then. I'll pick up Le Point's report on the way out. Are you on to anything? Maybe. I, I don't know. Anyway, after we've eaten, I'm going to spend the rest of the night having a prowl around the Georges Sank. We'll see what comes of that. Good evening. Good evening, monsieur. What can I do for you? Is Monsieur Gilles in his office? Monsieur Gilles has gone home, monsieur. Ah. Can I help? Well, I'm Superintendent Maigret. Ah, the keys of 332 and 347. I have them here. Ah, thanks. I just want to warn you that I intend to wander about the hotel for a while. I quite understand. The staff have been instructed to let you come and go as you please. Oh, good. Well, don't worry. I'll be as discreet as possible. Thank you, Superintendent. Just let me know if you should want anything. Oh, thank you. I will. <laughs> In a hotel, a detective is about as welcome as a thief. <laughs> Everything must be discreet. Everything must turn on well-oiled wheels. For the people who patronize these places, it must be their home. Everything must be arranged, looked after, made convenient. What would happen if they were plunged into ordinary life? Would the wards, Van Merlin's, Peverini's be capable of elbowing their way through a crowd to take the metro? consulting a timetable, carrying a suitcase. And if this five-star life of theirs was suddenly threatened, how would they react? Can I help you, Superintendent? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, can I direct you anywhere? Uh, I'm looking for the bar. Uh, straight ahead, monsieur. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, Superintendent. What would you like? Uh, have you any Calvados? Calvados? Oh, we don't often get asked for that. Just for a moment while I find it. Mm. Oh, uh, let's see what Lapointe's report says about the bar. Ah, uh, 10 p.m. The barman noticed Arnold in the left-hand corner by the window in the company of three Americans who included a film producer and an actor's agent. They were playing poker. According to the night porter, the third man, who is not a hotel guest, was seen taking his leave of Arnold in the foyer about 
2 a.m. Your Calvados, monsieur. Ah, thank you. Now, tell me, those three men playing poker over there, are they American? That's right. The one on the left's a film producer. He's quite famous, I believe. A uh, man near to him is a, an actor's agent. I, d- I don't know what the third man does. Were they here the night before last? One of your inspectors asked him that. Yes, they were. Was Mr Arnold with them? <laughs> Mr Arnold made up the fourth. Hmm. Look, I'd like you to do something for me. Oh, what? What sort of something? Well, when I get up and leave in a moment, go across and explain to them who I am. Say I'm conducting an investigation and require corroboration for a statement. Now, ask the third man, the one with fair hair, if it's true that he's not staying at this hotel and that when he left the night before last, it was Mr Arnold who saw him out to the foyer. Well, that's a bit unusual. No, did you just do as I say? Well, all right. Didn't you tell me to? Mm, right. Now, go across now. I'll be back later. Well, I uh, I closed the bar at one. No, I'll be back by then. I, I'm just going to wander around for a while. Good evening, monsieur. Mm. Uh, can I help you? Hey, yes. Hi. Yes. Been walking by the hotel and now I'm lost. You can tell me where I am. You're on the third floor, monsieur, in the service area. Oh, the third floor? You're the night waiter? Uh, yes, monsieur. Uh, you're Superintendent Maigret, aren't you? Ah, you've been warned about me. What's your name? Jules, monsieur. Well, Jules, there's something you can tell me. If I wanted to get out of the hotel as quickly as possible, meeting as few people as possible, which way should I go? Just keep on down these service stairs, monsieur. Yeah? Uh, when you get to the bottom, the exit is facing you. Uh, come over here, monsieur. Yeah? Uh, if you look down through this window, you can just see the doorway. Ah, I see. There's a man in a white jacket coming out. Where's he going? Uh, probably to the bar in the Rue Magellan. It's used a lot by the staff. Uh, yes, there he goes. Mm, I see. Does he stay open all night? Oh, yes. It's quite often patronised by hotel guests coming back in the small hours. Uh, some nice girls go there. Yeah, thank you, Jules. Uh, by the way, I'm going to look round 332 and 347. I've got the keys. That's all right, monsieur. We've been told about that. Hmm. Well, everything appears to be in order. Ah. Still some whiskey left. No harm in sampling it. And a pipe, I think. So... Why was Ward killed? Mm. Someone in his circle must have been threatened or felt threatened with suddenly having to live like everyone else and couldn't face the prospect. Ward's death must have ensured the person concerned could keep the way of life to which he or she was accustomed. Someone who knew Ward's ways, who knew that he always got into his bar so sozzled that he would hardly put up a struggle if his head was held firmly under water. Hmm. Uh, <clears throat> oh, there you are. It, mm. It's one o'clock. I was just closing. Did you manage to find out anything from the Americans? Yes. Uh, they were rather surprised that it wasn't the way things were done in their country. Huh. The uh, fair-haired man said he wasn't quite sure what happened the other evening because he was pretty drunk. But he mm. thought he remembered saying goodnight to Mr Arnold in the foyer. Uh. Uh, he was under the impression that Mr Arnold was staying in the hotel. You're quite sure about that? 
He thought that Arnold was staying here at the George Sank. That's what I gathered. I'm sorry to get you out of bed, Luca, but things have become rather urgent. That's all right, Chief. What time is it? You're about half past one. Now, look, it's a bit of a shot in the dark, but it can't wait. I'm rounding up certain witnesses who may or may not have seen the person we want to interview about the night of the murder. Now, La Pointe is picking them up now. He knows where to find them. I want them put in the inspector's room and seated in the following order. Uh, the night waiter and the housekeeper of the third floor of the Jour Sank, the barman of a bar in the room Magellan, two tarts who frequent the place and who were there on the night in question, an old girl who sells flowers halfway between the Georges Sank and the Hotel Scribe, and possibly the reception clerk at the Scribe. And I, I want you and La Pointe to be seated at your desks, going through papers which might be taken for depositions. Have you got all that? Yes, Chief. Good. I'll be with you shortly. I'm just on my way to the Hotel Scribe. Good evening, monsieur. Uh, good evening, Superintendent Maigret, police judiciaire. There's my authority. What can I do for you, Superintendent? Is Mr. John Arnold in? Yes, sir. He came in about half past ten. Is that his usual time? Uh, no, normally he's much later. Now, what time did he come in last night? Um, shortly after midnight. And the night before, after three o'clock? Possibly. You know, we're not obliged to give information about the comings and goings of our guests. You are if the police require it. Oh, I see. In that case, yes, um, it was after three o'clock. Half past three, to be exact. I remember because it was shortly before I was called up to quieten some noisy guests. Oh, thank you. Well, I must warn you to hold yourself in readiness in case your testimony is required at the Quai des Orfèvres later tonight. Now, will you be kind enough to put me through to John Arnold? Just bring his room. I'll speak to him myself. Very well. It's ringing. Here you are. Thanks. Hello? Um, Mr. Arnold? Who is that? Uh, Superintendent Maigret, I'm... Sorry to disturb you, Mr. Arnold, at this hour, but I need your help. The matter is very urgent. Um, what's it about? Where are you? Uh, downstairs in your hotel. I I'd like to come up and talk to you. Can't it wait till morning? Well, the matter is extremely urgent. No. Oh, very well, then. You'd better come up. Thank you. Just come in, Superintendent. Thank you. Uh, once again, I must apologize for getting you up at this hour. I went to bed early. I had a very heavy day. Yes, I imagine there's a great deal to do in the matter of Colonel Ward's estate. I gather the English lawyer's over here. Yes, it's all very complicated. Uh, well, uh, how can I help you? As you say, it is all very complicated. Now, my men at police headquarters have made certain discoveries which I should like to bring to your attention. Discoveries? I think it would be best if we went into this with the evidence before us. As you yourself stress, Colonel Ward's death is bound to have widespread repercussions. If you wouldn't mind getting dressed and coming along with me. Where to? In my office at the Quai des Orfèvres. Oh, can't we talk here? Well, not in the circumstances. Oh. Well, uh, very well. Give me a few minutes. Certainly. I'll get the desk to call a taxi. Uh, this is the inspector's room. After you, Mr. Arnold. I'll call you back. I, I, um... Did you say something, Mr. Arnold? Uh, oh, no, no, nothing. Uh, have you the written statements, Luca? Yes, Chief. Good. Uh, this way, Mr. Arnold. My office is over there. Please go in. Who, uh, who are all those people out there? Oh, didn't you recognize them? No, why should I? 
They know you. What do you mean? Well, there's one more to come, the reception clerk from your hotel. He noted your return at 3.30 two nights ago. What of it? Uh, he's the last of a chain of witnesses to your movements the night before last, when you were seen emerging from Colonel Ward's suite just after three in the morning, the time the murder was committed. They're seated next door in the order in which they saw you. I'll call them in one by one so that they can describe in their own words... Stop. You wish to tell me something? Uh, uh, I, I... Well, please sit down, Mr. Arnold, if you don't feel well. Uh, you've no proof. Proof of what? We know of your close association with Ward's wife, Muriel Ward. During the two-year period, her lawyers were haggling with the colonels over the divorce settlement. Now, by the way, when was the divorce going to become absolute? In, in, in three days' time. Hmm. She soon realized that even the best terms she could expect to receive as a divorced wife would compare very unfavorably with the extremely large estate she would inherit as his widow. But to achieve this, she needed an accomplice. Oh, this is fantastic. A man who would grasp the opportunity to secure the life to which he, too, had become accustomed. And if the prospective wealthy widow, with whom this man had established intimate relations, offered him marriage on condition that he disposed of her husband... Oh, this is preposterous. There's not a shred of evidence. Very well, Mr. Arnold. In that case, I have no alternative but to bring Muriel Ward in for questioning. She will sit where you are sitting now, and I shall go on questioning her without let up until I get the answers I seek. Do you want me to do that? Well, Mr. Arnold? No. Then you confess to the murder of David Ward? Yes. And you're prepared to make a statement to that effect? Yes. Just a moment. Luca? Superintendent? Will you come and take a statement from Mr. Arnold, please? Right away, Chief. Uh, just a moment. Come over here. The witnesses can go. We don't need them now. He's confessed. Yes, thank God my bluff worked. He assumed that all those witnesses had seen him on the night of the murder and that by piecing their evidence together, I would have an open and shut case. You bluffed him? Yes, 50% fact and 50% guesswork. I bluffed him and he cracked. Now take down his confession carefully. It's the only thing that will convict him. I'll see to it, Chief. I'm going home. Oh, I'm suddenly very, very tired. Look at him sitting in there. What sort of an impression does he give you? Mr. Arnold? A man who has lost the game. You're right, he has. Treat him gently. Good night, Mr. Arnold. Maurice Denham played Superintendent Maigret in Maigret and the Millionaires by Georges Simenon, translated by Jean Stewart and dramatised for radio by Malcolm Stewart. Luca was played by Brian Haynes, La Pointe, John Rye, Mr Arnold, Andrew Sachs, the Countess, Jane Wenham, Van Merlin, David March, Jules, Michael Bilton, the maid, Moya Leslie, the nurse, Carol Boyd, director, William Edel, the manager of the Georges V, Geoffrey Collins, the hotel doctor, Timothy Bateson, the prosecutor, Arnold Diamond, the magistrate, Clive Panto, Dr. Powell, Michael Tudor Barnes, Inspector Benoit, Ian Oliver, Jean, Sean Barrett, the masseur, Mark Straker, and the manager of the Lausanne Palace, Bernard Brown. The play was directed by Glyn Dearman. Unnatural Death is a 1927 mystery novel by Dorothy L. Sayers, her third featuring Lord Peter Whimsey. It was published under the title The Dawson Pedigree in the United States in 1928. 
looking for another opening. I see. Doctor, I'd like to ask you something. Yes, Inspector. You say that finally you did sign a death certificate. Against my professional judgment. Mm. But nevertheless stating death from natural causes. In so many words, yes. The nearly 18 months have gone by. Do you still think you were wrong to sign it? I'm afraid I do. So what you're saying, Doctor? What I'm saying is that that certificate should have simply read murder. Unnatural Death. The novel by Dorothy L. Sayers, dramatized for radio by David Geary. With Hugh Burden as Lord Peter Wimsey and Clifford Norgate as Detective Inspector Charles Parker. Unnatural Death. More coffee, my lord. Thank you, Bunter. We kept you up rather late last night, Bunter. Don't mention it, my lord. Did Inspector Parker get a cab all right? There was one on the rank, my lord. Good. Is this my cousin's marmalade you gave me this morning? Yes, my lord. Hmm. It's a bit watery. Really, my lord? Yes. Funny thing about women, the stronger they are, the weaker their marmalade. I wonder why they're so keen on making the stuff. I'm told it has a soothing effect on the nervous system, my lord. Ah, that might explain it, Bunter. Still, I think we'll go back to the Oxford tomorrow, if you've no objection. Certainly, my lord. Good. By the way, how's the photography these days? Very satisfactory, my lord. I've just acquired a new camera, which is giving excellent results. Really? Yes, my lord. A Thornton Picard. It should prove most useful in our more specialised work. Hmm. Well, I'd like to see some prints when you have a moment. Of course, my lord. Ah, call us already. I see who it is, my lord. Perhaps it's the man from the Gaslight and Coke. Oh, good morning, sir. Good morning, Butter. Come in, sir. Thanks. Is that Inspector Parker, Butter? Uh, yes, my lord. Ah, I wondered if I'd find you up. Of course I'm up, Charles. Have some coffee. Splendid. We thought you might be the man to read the meter. Oh. Uh, look, you can't have had breakfast. Let Bunter get you some. No, no, no. I'm quite all right, thanks. It'd be no trouble, sir. No, really, Bunter. The coffee's just what I want. Oh. Will that be all, then, my lord? Uh, yes, fine. Thank you, my lord. Uh, Charles, for someone who only left this flat a few hours ago, he could return with a remarkable dispatch. Yes, I suppose I have. And I should really be over at Nottingdale. And I've been thinking over all that business last night. So have I. Yes, I'm damn sure you have. Well? I think there's a danger in reading too much into it. You do? Yes. And I have a feeling that unless I put a few simple points to you in the cold light of dawn, you're going to be off on another of the famous whimsy investigations. Anything wrong with that? Well, only that I always seem to get caught up in them. Look, Peter, what does last night really boil down to? Well, we dined together in Soho, met a young and somewhat serious member of the medical profession, and brought him back here to join us in a glass of port. And? And the gentleman told us a rather interesting story, which you come round to tell me you don't believe. No, I believe it. But I don't think it need be interpreted the way he thinks it should. As a case of murder? Well, that's what he thinks it is. And you? On the facts that he gave us, death from natural causes. Hmm. On the facts that he gave us. What are the facts, as you see them? Well, these. We meet a young man who tells us he's a doctor. He doesn't disclose his name. He tells us that three years ago, in 1924, he took over a practice in an unspecified town in Hampshire. Yes. Now, one of his patients is a cancer case. An old lady, then aged 72. She lives alone with her only relative, her niece. Mm -hmm. Over a year later, in the autumn of 1925, the niece begins to be concerned that her aunt is getting much worse. The doctor discounts this. Early in November, he's called to the house in the middle of the night to find the patient in great pain. He gives her a morphine injection and examines her very thoroughly the following day, but finds nothing to worry about. Three days later, the old lady dies. From natural causes? Is there any evidence to the contrary? No. No. Nevertheless, the doctor finds he is unable with a clear conscience to give a death certificate, since in his opinion there is no obvious cause of death, and he asks for a post-mortem which he is able to conduct himself. However, as the deceased had wished for cremation, another doctor is required to sign the certificate jointly. The two physicians work on the autopsy together. It reveals nothing. Our friend finally, though still reluctantly, signs a certificate. Cause of death, cancer. Immediate cause, heart failure. Mm. And to complete the story, the crematorium gets worried, so the poor old dear has to be buried instead. Mm. The coroner starts to poke his nose in, rumours rife, and our young Hippocrates is forced to leave town and is now looking for another opening, as he puts it. Mm, that's about it. Yes. You know, Charles, as a sapper of morale and general dampener of enthusiasm, you are without peer. 
if you'll excuse my use of the expression. Oh, I'm sorry. Those are the facts. They are the medical facts. And they are the only ones that count. Charles, aren't you assuming that because the available medical evidence points to death from natural causes, that therefore foul play is automatically ruled out? Well, yes, that's the whole point. Yes. In fact, you're assuming that the medical evidence is both accurate and complete. Yes. Well, I mean, Suppose it... it's incomplete. What? Two doctors examined that body, one with close knowledge of the deceased, the other entirely independent. They found nothing. As would 99 doctors out of 100. The hundredth might be looking for something the others weren't. But looking for what? I don't know. But mightn't it be rather fun to find out? Taxi? Taxi? No, no, he's going up Hamilton Terrace. Ah, so he is. Look, I can spare one hour, not a second more. An hour will be ample. You do realize what you're up against. Not only has our doctor not given you his name, he's deliberately not told you the old lady's name, or even where all this is supposed to have happened. True, Charles. And what's more, he really only wanted to get the story off his chest. He didn't want anything done about it. No, but I think he'd be pleasantly surprised if something was, and I think we're the people to do it. We? Uh, a slip of the tongue. Glad to hear it. Uh, hi, taxi. Where exactly are we off to? Pimlico. Pimlico? Yes, I've a... I've a friend there I'd like you to meet. A friend? Yes, you like her. I've got her fixed up in a little flat. Her? Yes. Oh. Where to, Gov? 197A St George's Square. Right, sir. In you go, Charles. That's it. Yes, she's very comfortably fixed up. Only a, a modest little place, of course, but that's all she wanted. Really? Uh, yes. Uh, how long? Uh, oh, uh, only a few months. I see. Uh, she's quite unique, you know, Charles. A wonderful person. Splendid. Must be marvellous for you. It is. I'm sure you'll like her. I'm sure I will. And she'll be most intrigued to hear about our doctor friend. Mm. What's her name, by the way? Miss Clibson. Alexandra Catherine Clibson. How very interesting, Lord Peter. Really, extremely interesting. And how very disturbing for the poor young doctor. Exactly, Miss Clipson. Very disturbing. And you say that if there hadn't been such a scandal, he would be happily married by now. Married, certainly. And I trust happily. Such a pity. Yes. But of course, Miss Clipson, there's more to the affair than we've told you so far. Ah. Well, now, before you go on, I must ask you both if I can offer you a cup of coffee. Charles? Hmm? Uh, no, not for me, thank you. Are you sure, Inspector? With a shortbread biscuit? Uh, no, really. It's most kind of you, Miss Clemson. And I won't either, Miss Clemson, but don't let us stop well, you. No, no, Lord Peter, a little on the early side for me. Now, do go on. Well, what we've told you up to now are the essentials. But there are one or two rather interesting details to go with them. I see. Now, it seems that the old lady we're speaking of was very well off. Mm -hmm. She'd had to undergo an operation during the time she's been looked after by our friend, the doctor. And because of the risk involved, he thought it wise to ask her if she had made a will. Mm -hmm. Well, she hadn't. She had no intention of making one. Oh, most unwise. She said a will wasn't necessary because her niece who lived with her was our only kith and kin. Mm, famous last words. Well, I know, but you'll never convince some people. No. Now, I gather, by the way, that a solicitor call on the old girl at some stage, managing to get her pretty worked up about something. But whether that had anything to do with the will, no one seems to know. Now, about the niece, Lord Peter... What sort of girl is she? Well, about 26, 27 or so. Mm -hmm. Good education, self-reliant. Keeps her head in emergencies. That sort of type. She'd been a nurse. Really? That's right. She'd been at the Royal Free. Of course, when she gave up her job to look after her aunt, nursing didn't come into it. She was more of a companion. I see. After the operation, it was a different matter. An outside nurse was brought in then. Mm, whom the doctor seems to have thought pretty highly of. Oh, yes. Yes, yeah, so much so that they got engaged to each other. Oh, I see. How romantic. Most. <laughs> Now, I wanted to ask you, why did the niece start to get worried about her aunt's condition? H had there been some sort of incident? Well, that we're not clear about. All we know definitely is what happened early in November 1925. When the doctor was called out at night? That's right. He found she wasn't in any immediate danger, though. He gave her some morphia, and that was that. Next day, he overhauled her very carefully, and somewhat surprisingly found she was doing even better than he'd supposed. Yes, and three days later, she was dead. Oh, terrible. Indeed. And again, somewhat surprisingly, from the doctor's viewpoint, no wound, no hemorrhage, no sign of a struggle, not a single obvious symptom. But, Lord Peter, would there be? I mean, the aunt was 73 by then. She had cancer. She, she had to go sometime. Oh, I know, I know. Nevertheless... What? 
Well, one or two things don't seem quite right. For instance, I think that business of the old lady not making a will comes into it somehow. Oh, how? Well, I just don't know, Charles. And another thing, I believe cancer patients very seldom pop off in that rather unexpected way. Our young medico is aware of that too. That's why he felt he had to have a post-mortem. But the point that intrigues me most is the niece. How do you mean? She told the doctor her aunt's condition was deteriorating. But in fact, it wasn't. Oh, come, Peter. That's only the doctor's opinion. A medical opinion, Charles. Yes, well, all right. But what about the niece's opinion? She was a trained nurse. Yes, uh, she was, wasn't she? Oh, look, you've got other things to do, Charles. We mustn't keep you. Uh, Miss Crimson? Yes, Lord Peter. I think that's pretty well all we can tell you about the business at this stage. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, I'd like to know some more. Uh, yes, of course, Lord Peter. Now, what would you like me to do? Well, quite a lot. First of all, we know this happened in Hampshire, but we don't know the name of the town, mm -hmm. nor do we know the name of the deceased. Mm -hmm. We need that information before we can do anything. Yes, of course. If you'll be so good then, Miss Timpson, would you go down to Somerset House and get them to look up all the death certificates for Hampshire in the month of November 1925? I see. If you have to give any reason for your search, you could suggest you're compiling some statistics about cancer. Yes. Now, the certificate we want will state age, 73, yes. cause of death, cancer, Doctor. immediate cause, heart failure. Yes. And it'll have been signed by two doctors. Now, suppose there is more than one certificate like that. Ah, well, that's where the really hard work comes in. And where, if I may say so, we shall benefit from your remarkable qualities of shrewdness and discretion. <laughs> Lord Peter. Yes, I mean it, Miss Gibson. Look, we had better be off, Charles. Yes. Oh, uh, I'll see you out. Now, how soon do you think you can get started, Miss Gibson? Oh, straight away, Lord Peter. I can get down to Somerset House at once. Excellent. Well, when you've finished at Somerset House, Perhaps you telephone the flat and let me know what you found. Yes, of course. And after that, I shall probably ask you to take a little trip to Hampton. I understand. Good. Now, is this your hat, Inspector? That's the one, Miss Clemson. Thanks. It's been such a pleasure meeting you. Uh, well, I hope we'll meet again, Miss Clemson. I'm sure you will, Charles. Now, we'd better make a noise like a hoop and roll away. <laughs> Goodbye, then, Miss Clemson. Goodbye, Lord Peter. I I'll telephone as soon as possible. Uh, Goodbye, Inspector. Goodbye, Miss Clemson. Well, Charles, that's got things underway. That is patently clear. My worst fears are confirmed. Hmm? There's only one question. Who is Miss Clemson? Charles, it's not what you think. Well, even I don't imagine that. Miss Clemson, Charles, is a manifestation of the wasteful way this country is run. Oh. Thousands of ladies like her, mistresses of the art of gossip, are left unused, while the work for which they are so eminently fitted is inefficiently carried out by ill-equipped policemen such as yourself. Thank you very much. I'm quite serious. People want questions asked to who they send. A man with large feet and a notebook. I send a lady with a long woolly jumper on knitting needles. Of course she asks questions. Everyone expects it. And because of that, Charles, she has a very good chance of getting results. Hello? Go ahead, caller. Mm? Oh, 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 thank you. Lord Peter? Yes? Uh, Miss Clemson here, Lord Peter. I I've just left Somerset House. Ah, good day, Miss Clemson. What sort of luck? Well, it all depends. There are four towns in Hampshire with certificates that match the details we're after. Four? Yes. Meryton, Woolbridge, Lee Hampton, and Harmsworth. Hmm. Well, I think we're lucky it's only four. <laughs> How do you feel about finding which one it is? like to very much good excellent uh, what i thought of was that perhaps you might be a retired lady in easy circumstances looking for a nice little place to settle down in yes hampshire would suit you very well i imagine oh very pleasant county yes <laughs> now there's no need to rush over this let me have your reports just when it suits you right i think you may have some rather tiresome spade work in the early stages but once you hit the right town i'm pretty sure you'll know fairly quickly it's not that long ago since this particular death and it won't have been forgotten yet by a long chalk. Thank you, Miss Clemson. Just back, Mrs. Budge. Lunch won't be long. Oh, no hurry, please. I've had such a busy morning. I'd be glad of a little sit down. Oh, 
I know how you feel. <laughs> Been shopping, have oh, you? Yeah, just one or two things, but there's always something else one seems to need. When you're away from home? Yes. Oh, I know. It's hankies with me. Oh. Pack everything but hankies. I've piled them upstairs because of it. Always buying new. Oh, dear, how awful. No, no, most of this is knitting wool. I, I needed some more for my nephew's cricketing sweater. Oh, yes. Oh, those sweaters take a lot, mm. I know. I'm on a tea cosy at the oh. moment. Only three ounces, so I got off lightly. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> well, what do you think of Lee Hampton, then, Miss Clemson? Oh, very pleasant, very pleasant. The... The winter gardens seem particularly charming. I I thought I might take a, a proper walk around there this afternoon. Oh, yes, you should. Of course, we're quite famed for our winter gardens, oh. you know, especially for our tropical plants. Oh, yes. Oh, but... yes. Come from far and wide to Leanton, you know, botanists and people. Really? Oh, yes. And then there's the water, of course. Uh, water? Oh, yes. Uh, water's very famous, Leanton oh. water. Very good for rheumatism, they say. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah. And the air's so good. You were staying at Meriton before, did you say? Uh, uh, yes, just for a few days, yes. The, the, then I had a, a little while in Woolbridge. Meriton's very nice. That's where my sister lives. Uh, but I never think it's a patch on Lee Hampton. The air's nothing like as nice. <laughs> lovely air here, don't you think? Oh, lovely, yes. Uh, tell me... Do you think I'll be able to find a good doctor here, Mrs. Budge? That would be most important. Oh, no trouble finding a doctor in Leanton. No? Oh, no, bless me, no trouble at all. Now, I'm with Dr. Harper myself. He's such a nice man. I know you'd like him. Oh. He's just round the corner in Coppice Lodge. Oh, yes. Now, there's Dr. Frost. Mm -hmm. He's spoken very highly of. Very expensive, uh -huh. but very highly qualified. And then there's Dr. Benson. Yes. Uh, he's more for the children, though. Oh, mm. And Dr. Mitchell over in the Crescent. Oh, they're all spoken very well of. You'd be in safe hands with any yes, of them. That sounds most encouraging. The, the only thing about doctors, Mrs. Budge, is that I never feel quite happy about some of the younger ones. Oh, I know. I do feel an elderly doctor is so much more dependable. Oh, I know exactly what you, you know, mean. I, I know yes. exactly, Miss mm. Clemson. Do me, yes. Oh, and you know, it's funny you should say that about young doctors. We had some very strange goings-on in that line only a little while back. In Leehampton? Yes. In Wellington Avenue. Poor old Miss Dawson. Uh, uh, how do you mean, Mrs. Budge? Oh, what dreadful business it was. Now, the doctor there was only just out of his cradle. Caused no end of trouble. Dr. Carr. You wouldn't recommend him, then? I should certainly think not, Miss Clemson. Nor would anyone else, I can tell you. But you're quite safe anyway, because he left a few months ago. Went back to London. Ah, yeah. Oh, a dreadful business. Mm. Old Miss Dawson died of cancer. And that Dr. Carr had the cheek to say she'd been done in. You, you mean she... Done in, <gasps> Miss Clemson. Good heavens, did she actually say that? Oh, no, no, not him. He never actually said anything. Just hinted... A very sneaky sort, altogether. Oh, how dreadful. It was dreadful. I don't know how poor Miss Whitaker stood it all. Uh, Miss Whitaker? Oh, Miss Dawson's niece. Oh, yes. Such a nice young lady. Thought the world of her aunt. <laughs> how she put up with it all, I just don't know. Oh. Especially that nurse, little baggage. Oh, there was a nurse there, too? Oh, well, there had to be, you see, because the old lady needed a lot of looking after. Oh, of course. But the way it went... That Dr. Carr got more looking after from the nurse than all Miss Dawson ever got. <gasps> Mrs. Bush! No, no, tis the truth. Ask anyone. Oh, how dreadful. Indeed it was. Fluttering her eyelashes at Dr. Carr when she should have been looking after the old lady. No wonder Miss Whitaker had to give her the sack. Mm. Mm. Fillymore. That was her name. Nurse oh. Fillymore. Came from one of the big London hospitals, too. Oh, really? And they took her back there, so I'm told. <gasps> you wouldn't credit it, would you? I'm afraid I'm still a little puzzled, Lord Peter. How did you get to know about all this in the first place? Uh, good question, Miss Fillmore. In fact, from your fiancé. From Dr. Carr? Exactly. But as far but as... But as far as he's concerned, the case is closed? Yes. Yes. But you know, it's my personal belief it shouldn't be. I see. Uh, do sit down. Thank you. Might I hazard a guess that you share that belief? 
I think the whole thing was desperately unfair, yes, but I'm not sure it'll do any good to bring it up again after all this time. I think it may, you know, if only to restore a little confidence all round. My impression is that neither you nor the good doctor are exactly fools where medical matters are concerned, but that you can't help thinking you were in the Lee Hampton affair. That puts it quite well. Look, I really don't want to bother you much. It's most kind of you to see me at all. But there are one or two things I'm particularly interested in. Now, there was a visit from a solicitor at some stage. I believe it agitated your patient somewhat. Was that in your time? Uh, no, it was before Miss Dawson had her operation. Mm. But I did hear he wasn't a Lee Hampton solicitor. Uh, no one knew where he came from or what he wanted. The maids that were there met him, but they were dismissed when I was. Really? Oh, that's a pity. Always a sort of sinister charm about mysterious solicitors. And this Fillimore, if you'll excuse me touching on this point, a lot of people in Lee Hampton seem to think your relations with Dr. Carr exceeded the bounds of propriety. Oh, you know all about that, then? I'm afraid so. It really was damnable. I had the most dreadful interview with Matron when I got back here. How much truth was there in what people were saying about you? None. Absolutely none. They were nothing but vicious stories, and she must have started them. She? Miss Whitaker. Oh, yes. Of course, you became engaged to Dr. Carr, didn't you? Well, yes, I did. But you're not saying that's a crime. My dear girl, I'm not saying anything. Might Miss Whitaker have thought it a crime, though? What? Dr. Carr's very prepossessing sort of chap. Perhaps you beat her to the post, so to speak. I see. I see what you mean. Miss Fillimore, may I ask you this? Uh, yes. How do you think Miss Dawson died? I think she was murdered, but I just don't know how. Mm. Who do you think did it? Miss Whitaker. I see. Well, look, I'm really most grateful to you. You can hardly be pleasant dragging all this up again. That's quite all right. In fact, you've been extremely helpful. Anyway, I'll make a noise like a bee and buzz off. <laughs> oh, uh, just one thing. Yes? The maids. The maids. Yes. Why were they dismissed? Oh, well, they were sisters. A lot of crockery was smashed, apparently. Hmm? Miss Whittaker gave one of the girls notice, so the other left with her. They had a funny sort of name. Uh, go to bed. That was it. Really? Go to bed? Yes. Bertha and Evelyn. They were very sweet girls. And was a lot of crockery smashed? Well, I wouldn't have said so, but then I wasn't in the kitchen that much. Any idea where the girls went to afterwards? I'm afraid not. But I dare say you could find out. Yes, thank you. I dare say I will. You know, Peter, I still can't seriously believe there was anything odd about that woman's death. After all, all you've got to go on are people's opinions and a lot of silly gossip. Charles, I know there was something odd about it. And the deeper we dig, the odder it gets. You and Miss Clemson, you mean? Mainly Miss Clemson. She's been extremely active. I wish I could say the same. The trouble is, I've been playing the waiting game for quite a while, and it doesn't exactly suit me. What do you mean? Well, after I saw Nurse Fillimore, I thought the best idea would be to have a word with those maids. So I put an advertisement for them in all the agony columns. Here. Oh, thanks. Uh -huh. Bertha and Evelyn go to bed, formerly in the service of Miss Agatha Dawson of the Grove, Wellington Avenue, Lee Hampton, are requested to communicate with J. Murbles, solicitor of Staple Inn, London, WC1, when they will hear of something to their advantage. Hmm. Will they? Oh, yes. The main thing is, I will. Who's Murbles? Everyone's picture of the typical family solicitor. He happens to be our family solicitor. I see. I think it may be revealing to know something of the Dawson household from below stairs, so to speak. Yes. <coughs> uh, the uh, mid-morning editions, my lord. Oh, thanks, butter. Let's have them. Yes, certainly, my lord. Uh, there. Charles? Uh, I'll have the star. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, will there be anything else, my lord? Uh, no, thanks. Thank you, my lord. Oh. What's... What's London offering us today? Uh, Murder, mystery, or mayhem? Well, mystery, by the sound of it. Hmm? She's got this Epping Forest business. What? A girl's body found in forest. No sign of foul play, say police. Uh, uh, yes, yes, got it. The unidentified body of a young woman, fully clothed, was found early this morning in a secluded part of Epping Forest. Mm. Death, which appears to be from natural causes, took place about two to three days ago. Yes. Anything more? Uh, no. Nothing that isn't padding. Ah. Hello? Oh, hello, Murbles. Oh, have you? Excellent. Bertha? Yes? 
The letter's from her, is it? Oh, my landlady, I see. Disappeared? When? Tuesday. I see. Four o'clock this afternoon. Yes, all right, Mervyn, don't worry. I'll be there just before. Good. Thanks so much. Bye. The advertisement? Yes. A letter from Bertha Gotovitz's landlady. The girl hasn't been back to her lodging since she left there on Tuesday morning. Mm -hmm. The landlady then spotted the advertisement and got onto Merbel, so she is pretty worried. In fact, she thinks he's responsible. She's calling on him this afternoon. How long has the advertisement been in? Uh, a bit over a week. Went in on April the 20th. Mm -hmm. May I use the phone? Of course. Charles, could it be... Uh, would you give me Whitehall 1212? Yes, please. I think we ought to know, don't you? Yes. Oh, well, would you put me through to Inspector Barnard, please? Yes. Ah, Jim, Charles Parker here. <laughs> yes, yes, I know. Look, this Epping Forest business, body of a girl, is all I know is what they're carrying in the early editions. Anything through from Essex on identity yet? Uh, no, the papers don't give a name. Oh, would you? Yes, yes, of course. He's just checking. Yes. Uh, yes, Jim? I see. Yes. And the girl's name? Right, Jim, many thanks. Much obliged. Bye. Well? A waitress from the Coventry Street corner house. Yes? The body was found under some bushes. No sign of assault. Sandwich and bottle of beer nearby. Handbag intact. Among the contents, a five-pound note and a letter. Yes. Addressed to Bertha Gotobed. Yes, I I'm sorry you missed me just now. You just got back. Oh, have you? Well, that's very quick work. Uh, South Audley Street, yes. Uh, Mrs. Forrest was the lady's name. I see. You made a delivery to her on the 26th. Fine. Well, thank you very much. That's most helpful. Goodbye. Come in. Lord Peter Wimps is here, sir. Oh, thanks, Harvey. Uh, all right, if I come in? Yes, come in. Take a few. Thanks. Well... How did you get on? As well as could be expected. The landlady is no longer suspicious of Merbles. She's merely suspicious of me. Mm, and how about Merbles? He's suspicious of me too. So you're right. Yes. To be honest, Charles, I feel nothing better than a murderer. A poor, sweet and simple child. Dead. No, look, I'm sorry, Peter. but seeing that girl lying there under those bushes, it all seems so ordinary. Just a pleasant little picnic on a sunny day in spring. And it hadn't been a picnic. Peter, I know exactly what you're feeling at the moment. I know it isn't pleasant. But may I remind you, first of all, that the girl's death is most likely completely unconnected with this other business. No, it's connected, all right. I'm sorry, but at the moment there is no definite connection. Secondly, as far as we know, the girl died from natural causes. That's what we're meant to believe. All right, all right. We all know the views of Dr. Carr and Dr. Whimsy. But theories one thing, facts another. And the post-mortem will decide the facts. Anyway... One result seems to be that I've been landed with all this officially. I gather you've been bending the ear of your good friend, the Chief Commissioner. I have. Of course, he thinks the whole thing's complete coincidence. I don't blame him. Well, why not? Let's see what we've got. All right. Yes. Good. Now, tell me, did you get any sense out of the landlady? Indeed, I did. She turned out to be a very sensible person, Mrs. Gulliver. The two go-to-bed girls came to her straight after leaving Leehampton. Oh, yes? They both got taken on at the corner house together, as waitresses. And Bertha was working there right up to the time she disappeared. Mm. Evelyn, though, met a Canadian chap who used to take his breakfast in and married him. They're both settled in Canada now. And you had to break the news that Bertha is dead, of course. Yes, indeed. Mrs. G took it pretty badly. She seems to be very fond of the girl. I told her you might be in touch about formal identification of the body. Mm, good, yes. And we'll have to get a cable off to Canada to the sister. I got the sister's address for Mrs. Gulliver. Cropper is our married name. Ah, Evelyn Cropper. That's right. Good. Well, 
Any luck at your end? Well, some. We've managed to trace the fiver. Have you indeed? How about the beer bottle? Any fingerprints? Mm, I don't know. The laboratory lads have still got it. Mm. Now, about the five-pound note. It was one of a series issued to a bank in South Audley Street. On the 19th, they paid it out with two other fives and ten ones against a cash check drawn by a Mrs. Forrest. Ah. They gave me her address. It's further up South Audley Street. She has a flat in a small block above a flower shop. You've been over there, have you? Yes, thought it worth having a quick check. Did you see the lady? No, she was out. Well, is there a porter there? Yes, but he wasn't around either. He's got a small flat at the back. Well, he probably nipped out to do some shopping. But the flower shop seems to know about most of the tenants. Not much about Mrs. Forrest, though, because she's not often there. Mm -hmm. Well, she turns up occasionally and stays for just an hour or two. They sometimes know she's in residence because they see Fortnum's van delivering provision. So she does herself well, then. Yes. Now, I rang Fortnum's earlier, and they rang back just before you came in. They made a delivery to Mrs. Forrest's flat on the 26th, the same day Bertha disappeared. I see. Do we know what this Mrs. Forrest looks like? Yes. According to the flower shop girl, she has a most striking appearance. Tall, overdressed, hair peroxided, black eyebrows, powder very white, lips very red. Not hard to miss, one might say. Oh. And how does this striking lady get about? Does she run a motor? Yes, a Renault four-seater. It's garage at the back. The man there says it was out on the night of the 26th. The night Bertha didn't come back? Yes. It went out at 11.30, returned about 8 o'clock the next morning. Really? You know, on the face of it, this looks as if Mrs. Forrest could be called a provider of facilities. It looks a bit like it. I think we may find a gentleman somewhere who could confirm the theory. Mrs. Forrest brings the parties together and leads them to it. Something untoward happens and the body gets dumped at Epping. Parker. Oh, yes, put them through. Yes, hello? Yes. Oh, really? Uh, just now, was that? Right. Well, that's most kind of you to bother. Thank you very much, miss. Goodbye. That was the flower shop. I asked them to the ring if they spotted Mrs. Forrest. She's just gone up to the flat. Has she, by Jove? Yes. Now... Suppose you were accompanying me on an inquiry at any time. Could I rely on you to behave yourself, Peter? Ignoring your hurtful implication, of course you could. I wonder. And if you were accompanying me, could you provide yourself with a straightforward common or garden surname as opposed to a title? No problem at all. Miss Clinton suggested an alias might come in handy one day. We agreed on the name of her grocer, a chap called Templeton. Right. Well, in that case, Mr. Templeton, would you care to share a taxi to South Audley Street? Oh, here we are. As you say, Charles, it looks as if the tenants do themselves quite well here. Yes, looks like it. Not that I go for all these springy carpets myself. No, it is a bit like being in a picture palace. <laughs> yes? Ah, Mrs. Forrest? Yes? yes? I'm a police officer, Mrs. Forrest. And my card. Oh, uh, Detective Inspector Parker? Yes, that's right. And uh, this is Mr. Templeton. Uh, would you mind if we had a few words with you? What about? Well, might we discuss that inside? Well, uh, well, yes, I suppose so. Come in, will you? Thanks. Uh, Mr. Templeton? Uh, right. This way, through here. Thank you. Please sit down. Uh, thanks. The uh, cigarettes are there. Well, what's this all about? Uh, we're engaged in certain inquiries, Mrs. Forrest, and feel you may be able to help us. Oh? Yes. It's a question of a banknote that's been traced to your possession... A five-pound note issued to you by your bank on April the 19th. Oh, I see. You're not telling me it was forged or something. Well, that I'm not prepared to say, Mrs. Forrest. But you do admit receiving a note of that denomination on that date? Well, yes. Yes, I suppose so. I do remember drawing a cheque around that time for 25 pounds, I think. I see. So there wouldn't be just one five. There must have been three. I generally draw ten ones, and if there's more, the rest in fives. There'd have been three fives. Well, can you tell us to whom you paid them? Well, that's a bit difficult. There was a bill from the garage. I paid them cash. Mm. I think there was a five-pound note in that. Yes? Yes, yes, I'm sure there was. Then I dined out the next day with a woman friend. That definitely took the second one. Now, where did the third one go? Oh, I know, Newmarket. Uh, Newmarket? On the Saturday. I put it on a horse. <laughs> it wasn't even in the first six. I see. Well, uh, can you tell me which restaurant it was that you dined at, Mrs. Forrest, uh, and the name of your garage? Well, oh, I... Look, here, really... Inspector, all this business about fivers, it's getting us absolutely nowhere. I don't care a continental curse about the beastly fiver. A reputation is at stake. 
And that is the only thing that matters. Now, please, Mr. Oh, Templeton. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but I'm going to get to the bottom of this. Now, tell me, Mrs. Forrest, who was it? Who, who was it? Who was here with you on the 26th? The 26th? You don't deny you were here on the 26th. Well, I was, as a matter of fact, but I... I knew it! I knew it! You dined together that night, didn't you? Here? Yeah. No. Now, don't deny it. Don't deny it. I insist upon knowing who it was, Mrs. Forrest. There was no one. No one. Mr. Templeton. And they left at 11.30. I know. I insist on a name from you, Mrs. Forrest. I, I can't. I insist, I, I, Mrs. I, Forrest. I, it was a friend. Aha. Uh -huh. A friend, eh? Oh, please. Please, Mr. Templeton. Please don't ask for his name. So it was a man. Yes. Yes. Then I must know, Mrs. Forrest. I, I insist on knowing. Was it this man? Uh, what? This photograph. Take it. Uh, oh, yes. Look at it. Look at it carefully. Was that the man who was with you on the 26th? No. No, no, it was not. Thank God for that. <clears throat> there you are, Mr. Templeton. Uh, wh what did I tell you? I know, Inspector. I know. I, got, I simply had to be reassured. I... My, my dear Mrs. Forrest, a thousand apologies, but I, I can now go straight back to my cousin and put her mind completely at rest. I'm sorry, Mr. Templeton, I really don't understand. What has your cousin to do with all this? A and who is the man in this photograph? Oh, oh may I? Oh, yes, there. Uh, thanks. This, Mrs. Forrest, is my dear cousin Sylvia's husband, Lyndhurst. Now, none of this is perfect. I freely acknowledge that. But as a husband, Lyndhurst has a tendency to be a little less perfect than most. A friend of the family, who happens to live in this part of the town, was returning home on the night of the 26th and saw someone closely resembling Lyndhurst leaving these flats at around 11.30. He casually mentioned this to Sylvia when they next met. And as you can imagine, the poor girl was caused the very greatest distress. But uh, why, Mr. Templeton? Is there any reason why Mr. Lyndhurst... Major should... Lyndhurst. Oh, yes. Well, uh, why shouldn't Major Lyndhurst have been in this area that night? Because that night, Mrs. Forrest, that night he said... He was at the regimental dinner. Oh. <laughs> I see. You see? <laughs> but now we know the whole thing was just a mistake. I can get on to Sylvia and put her mind completely at rest. Mrs. Forrest, I can't say how sorry I am to involve you in our family affairs in this way. Oh, that's quite all right, Mr. Templeton. Don't worry about you it. You will forgive my abruptness, won't you? Oh, of course. I, I'm rather nervously constituted, I'm afraid, and the whole thing's been a bit upsetting. Oh, I quite understand. But uh, out of interest, how does the five-pound note come into all this? Perhaps you'd care to explain, Mr. Templeton? Ah, Mrs. Forrest. Hmm. I can rely on your confidence. Oh, completely. The five-pound note was found in a pocket of Lindhurst's regimentals, together with a lady's handkerchief. Oh. Oh, how very embarrassing. It was. And I'm sorry to say the matter is still shrouded in mystery. Yes, well, I think we'd best be off then, Mr. Templeton. Yes. Yes, yes, of course. I'll, I'll see you out. I'm sorry to take up your time too, Inspector, but I really was most concerned. That's all right, sir. Well, goodbye then, Mrs. Forrest. Sorry to have troubled you. Not at all. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mrs. Forrest. Most kind. Uh, do we need to call the lift, Inspector? No, sir. It seems to be here still. Oh, good. After you, sir. Uh, thanks. Now, may I ask what the devil you think you are up to? A good question, Charles. Ground floor? Yes, and you'd better have a damn good answer. I'll think one up when we get back to the flat. Going down? No, I'm sorry, Peter. It's just not good enough. I take you with me on an inquiry completely against everything in the book, and you mess things up with some damn fool pantomime about a Major Lindhurst. I really am sorry, Charles. And so you should be. We're still in the dark over where the car went. We don't know enough about the fiver, and we haven't the slightest idea if the woman has any connection with Bertha Gotobit. Ah. Well, you know, I have a pretty strong feeling she has. I don't want feelings, Peter. I want facts. But we may have some facts. May have. Look, won't you have a drink? I'll just ring for Bunter. What do you mean, we may have facts? Well, for a start, dear Mrs. Forrest's reactions. 
Wouldn't you say she was somewhat worried? Well, yes, extremely worried. But who wouldn't be with you going up in the air like that? But that woman was guilty. You could tell. Oh, for heaven's sake. She probably got a divorce coming through and didn't want to tell us about her gentleman caller. Well, look how relieved she was when she saw you were on a different tack. Yes, she was relieved. Very much so. It's what she was relieved about that's so interesting. Ah, Vanta? Uh, you rang, my lord? Yes, let's have something to drink. Charles, what would you like? Um, oh, scotch, I think, please. Good, and I'll have a pink gin. Very good, my lord. I'm sorry, Peter, I cannot see what you're driving at. Simply that Mrs. Forrest seemed more relieved to find us thinking she had a man in that night, any man, rather than a woman. Well? Therefore, my dear fellow, she did have a woman. More than likely, Bertha go to bed. I see what you mean. All right, I know you wouldn't class it as fact. But I'd be able to let you have something absolutely factual fairly soon. What? Another photograph of Major Lindhurst. Oh, Major Lindhurst. Look, who is this Major Lindhurst? Ah, you may well ask. Major Lindhurst is really our secret weapon. Let me carefully remove him from my wallet. There. Oh, don't touch him, whatever you do. What? Look, who is this chap, Peter? This photograph, it grieves me to say, is a snapshot of my brother Gerald, the 16th Duke of Denver, sent to me in this morning's post by my mother. Her reason for sending it is a complete mystery. Nevertheless, it has already proved itself to be of the greatest practical value. I don't follow. Of course you do, Charles. I've looked at it. You've looked at it. Mrs. Forrest has looked at it. Yes. And Mrs. Forrest has handled it. You old devil. <laughs> ah, that's splendid, Butter. Just here will do. Very good, my lord. Uh, will you take soda, sir? Yes, please, Bunter. By the way, how's the new camera, Bunter? Very satisfactory, my lord. It has produced some remarkable studies of my sister's goldfish, and I'm printing them now. Splendid. Well, when you want the goldfish out of the way, I'd be most grateful if you could turn your attention to this. Ah, a snapshot of his grace. Precisely, and not to be confused with the goldfish. Now, its real appeal lies not so much in its subject, but in the fingerprints on its surface. I understand, my lord. Do your usual excellent job with the powders, etc., etc., Photograph the result, do an enlargement, and let me have a copy for Mr. Parker as soon as you can. Certainly, my lord. I'll start work on it straight away. That's very good of you, Bunter. Not at all, my lord. Well, well, well. All I'm saying, Charles, is that it could come in handy. Oh, I agree, especially if there are any prints on that beer bottle. That's what I was thinking. All right, Peter, where do we stand? Mrs. Forrest may have had something to do with the go-to-bed girl. Again, she may not. The only link at the moment is still that fiver, which is a pretty weak link. Yes. But apart from that, we've got to get the post-mortem results. And after that, the inquest. And if all this has anything to do with the Lee Hampton business, I'll be very much surprised. Oh, by the way, how about our friend Miss Clemson? How near has she got to the Whittaker girl? Uh, I was going to tell you this morning. She's met her. Has she indeed? What did she make of her? Very pleasant, very efficient. Everyone down there seems to like her. Mm. Apparently, she's exploring the idea of chicken farming. <laughs> She's got a friend with the same idea, a girl called Vera Featherston. The two of them are away at the moment. They've taken a cottage for a fortnight near Orpington. There's a likely farm there, I gather. Mm. Uh, incidentally, Charles, you know we've always thought of old Miss Dawson being Miss Whitaker's aunt. Yeah. Well, it seems Miss Dawson used to live in Warwickshire with her cousin. She was Clara Whitaker. Yeah. They've been friends for years. Now, as a result of this friendship, Miss Dawson's sister married Clara's brother. Yeah. And the two old girls shared a nephew, Charles. Charles. And Charles's daughter, Mary, is our Miss Whitaker. Oh, I see. So although she always called Miss Dawson aunt, in fact she was really a great aunt. Hmm. Not such a close relation as we thought. No. Well, lucky for her, there wasn't anyone closer. Exactly. And another... Good heavens, Charles. I think you've hit it. What? I bet you anything, that's it. Look, this is 1927. All right? Yes. Yeah. And O. Miss Dawson died when? Uh, 1925, November 1925. November 1925, and without making a will. Charles, we must get on to Merville's. Merville's? My solicitor. Now, what's his number? It's nearly seven. He'll have left his office ages I'll ago. I'll bring him at home. I'll see if we can get him around here. Bunter can do us all a steak. Charles, I think we're onto something at last. I may be wrong, but I don't think so. It's something I read in a paper about a new act. An act? Act of Parliament, mm. a new property act, Charles, which I'm pretty sure came into force on the first day of 1926. Now, look, I knew this would happen, Merbles. 
I saw the danger signal as soon as you said the new act makes everything simpler. That was certainly the act's intention. Yes, well, our laws are littered with good intentions. Mm-hmm. Every act that makes things simpler needs another to disentangle it. Uh, some more port, Charles? Thanks. There we are. Uh, do you? I'm fine. Uh, Murmels, drop more for you. No, thank you. I'm doing very well. well help yourself if you want to. Uh, don't forget the cigars. Thank you. Surely, from what you've been saying, Mr. Mervels, any difficulty in interpreting the new property act lies in defining the word issue. Uh, if any brother or sister dies before the intestate, then to his or her issue. Oh, that's perfectly correct, Inspector. And my opinion, which I must stress is only a tentative opinion, would be, I think, that issue in this case means issue ad infinitum, and that therefore great nephews and great nieces would be entitled to inherit. Yes, and Mary Whitaker is Miss Dawson's great niece. Y- yes, all right. But Verbals, you say your opinion. Might there be another opinion? I'm afraid there might. The question is very complicated. What did I tell you? Yes, but frankly, I see no cause for concern in this particular instance. After all, Mary Whitaker was apparently the nearest surviving relative. Miss Dawson died in 1925. The old property act was still in force. So the money would pass without any question to Mary Whitaker. I see no ambiguity there. No, none whatever. In 1925, and always assuming there was no other surviving relative. Good Lord. I see what you're driving at. When did the new act come into force, sir? The 1st of January, 1926. Miss Dawson died in November, 1925. You see? But supposing she'd lived, as the doctor fully expected her to do, to a well into 1926, mm. would Mary Whitaker have definitely inherited them? I... I think that question is very relevant, Lord Peter. You raised a very serious and important point. If I understand you rightly, you're suggesting that any ambiguity in the interpretation of the new act might provide an interested party with a very good and sufficient motive for hastening the death of Miss Dawson. I mean exactly that. And if the interested party was Mary Whitaker, there are some further questions that need to be answered. Such as? Well, was there anyone who might have had a stronger claim under the new act than Mary Whitaker? And if so, did she know who that person was? Parker. Uh, Charles, it's Peter. Oh, hello. Uh, did you get my message about the go-to-bed post-mortem? Yes, Bunter told me. Hmm. A heart condition, would you believe it? Well, that's what they found. Apparently the girl had just eaten a heavy meal and that brought it on. Mm, no, it doesn't quite tie up with beer and sandwiches in Epping Forest. And there were no fingerprints on the beer bottle? No, only glove marks. I see. Well, the inquest will be pretty straightforward. I think it will. Oh, that was an excellent enlargement Bunter did of the fingerprints on that snapshot. Pity we couldn't tie it up with anything. Oh, well... Look, what I really rang about was a letter I've had from Miss Clemson. May I read you a bit? Yes, do. Well, after our chat with Mervis last week, I wrote to Miss C asking her to pursue the idea of another cabin to the Dawson estate. Yes. Well, I've had a reply this morning. I'll read you the bits important. Mm. She says, uh, I've just heard something which may be of use. Mrs. Budge remembers talking to a lady who acted as housekeeper to Miss Dawson before the time of the go-to-bed girls. I see. Uh, this lady mentioned, amongst other gossip, a rather unusual visitor who had called on Miss Dawson one day. Yeah. He was a black gentleman, she believed from the West Indies, who was, moreover, a clergyman. Mm. What intrigued the housekeeper especially was his visiting card, which was inscribed, the Reverend H. Dawson. Good heavens. Exactly. A relation? Well, that we don't know. Anyway, I got onto my old chum, Bishop Lambert, and we're trying to track the Reverend down. Hmm. Well, I wish you luck with him. By the way, how about your favourite suspect, Miss Whitaker? Is she still looking at chicken farms? She's due back tomorrow, uh, together with her friend Vera. I'll be interested to know how their expedition went. How do you mean? I'm wondering if Miss Whitaker's search for a chicken farm took her as far as Epping Forest. Toasted tea cake. Oh, splendid. And your ghetto here. Can I? All right. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you, madam. Oh, this looks <laughs> lovely, Miss Clemson. Yes, well, well, do tuck in, Vera. We mustn't let the tea cakes get cold. Right. Of course, after the last fortnight, I, I don't suppose you wanted to come back to Lee Hampton, Vera. 
Well, it was quite a wrench leaving the little cottage, I must say. Uh, yes, I'm sure. I mean, we got right away from everything there. Just the two of us. Nobody fussing around. It was really wonderful. Uh, I... I suppose you um, had somebody in to do the housework, though, didn't you? Oh, no. Didn't you? No, not a soul. We did every bit of it ourselves. Scrubbing floors, laying fires, everything. And Mary's a simply wonderful cook. I hadn't realised. Is she really? But well, you must have had a lot of business details to go into, didn't you? I mean, in, in connection with the chicken farm. Mm, yes, quite a lot. And of course, we got around the country a lot that way. We were checking on the markets. Oh, yes, yes, I was forgetting. You had the little Austin. Do you drive, Vera? Oh, no. No, Mary does all the driving, though she's going to teach me. Oh, that'll be nice. Did you uh, run up to town at all while you were there? No. Oh. But Mary, perhaps? No. Oh. Uh, well, I, I just thought you'd, you'd have taken the chance of a little jaunt. I mean, it's not very far from Orpington, is it? Well, I don't think Mary's very keen on London, really. No. Oh, uh, well. So, uh, the two of you stayed in Kent together all the time? Yes, every minute. And you didn't get bored with each other? Oh, no. Well, you both sound very fortunate, young people. <clears throat> but you know, a little change of companionship is good for everybody. I've known so many happy friendships spoiled by, by people seeing too much of each other. Well, I don't think they have been real friendships. I mean, Mary and I tell each other all our thoughts and feelings. We trust each other completely. We're really completely happy, Miss Clemson. Uh, that's fortunate, Vera. And if I were Mary Whitaker, I'd feel very touched to think that I, I had such a friend as you. A true friend, a loyal friend. Oh, Miss Clemson, how nice you are. No, I, I mean it. Uh, you may think you're lucky in knowing Mary, but she's the lucky one in knowing you. Do you think so? I'm such a silly person, really. But I do try to be a loyal friend. It is important, isn't it? Being loyal, you mean? Yes. Oh, yes. Yes, it is. As long as you're sure in your heart that the other person deserves your loyalty. Yes. Vera, may I say something? If you ever find yourself wanting to have a chat about anything, do let me know. It, it, it is useful at times to have an older person to talk to if you've got anything on your mind. Oh, Miss Clemson, that is kind of you. It, it, it was just an idea. Hey, when I was your age, there never seemed anyone I could go to for advice. All my aunts and uncles, they were very nice, but I could never talk to them. Oh, I know what you mean. So, if you ever have anything worrying you, Vera, and, and you want to get it off your chest, just let me know and we, we can try and sort it out together. That's very sweet of you, Miss Clemson. I'll remember that. Well, I'd say you've done a good job there, Sergeant Harvey. Puts things very clearly. Thank you, sir. I'll get a copy sent off to Essex. Hmm, half past. Lord Peter's late. He's not waiting outside, is he? I'll see, sir. He said he'd be here just after 11. No, no, Simon, sir. Uh, good morning, Simon. Oh. oh, here he is, sir. Just come in. Oh, good. Morning, sir. Good morning. Charles, I'm frankly sorry. Mrs. Myrtle let me down. Your monster motor car. Yes, the old bus got an airlock and a petrol feed. Took me a bit of time to trace it. Yes. Well, I gather you some progress to report. In certain directions. The main thing is we managed to track down the Reverend H. Dawson. Ah, have you met him? Yes, had quite a chat. We found he belonged to the Tabernacle Mission. They've got a place down in Stepney. Mm. Guess what the H stands for. No idea. Hallelujah. No. <laughs> yes. The Reverend Hallelujah Dawson. Mm. From the West Indies? Mm, from Trinidad. Back in 1810, apparently, one of the Dawsons, a chap called Simon, got press ganged at the Navy. And while he was out in the West Indies, he managed to jump ship. He married one of the local lasses, and dear old Hallelujah down at Stepney is his surviving grandson. I see. Well, how does the Reverend rate as a possible claimant? Ah, good question. I have to admit, I find it quite impossible to work out his exact relationship to the late Miss Dawson. But on the face of it, it looks as if Mary Whitaker wins the inheritance race fairly comfortably, at least under the old property act. I see. You see, what happened was that the sugar crop failed back home and hallelujah, and his flock fell on some pretty hard times. Well, then the old boy came across a bundle of family papers, thought his connections over here might be able to help, scraped up enough for the passage, got here, 
and then looked up the family solicitor in Warwickshire. Oh, he sounds determined. I suppose so. But it wasn't greed. It was simple poverty. Mm. Well, when he showed the solicitor all his papers, the solicitor had to point out that the old boy's relationship to Miss Dawson was extremely distant. Mm. But he gave him a letter of introduction and hallelujah went down to Lee Hampton to call on her. Yes. Well, apparently Miss Dawson was absolutely charming. And although he made it completely clear he hadn't the slightest claim on her, she upped and made him a yearly allowance, which continued till her death. Ah, and what happened after her death? Nothing. Nothing? Miss Dawson had told him she didn't like the idea of making a will, but that her niece would continue the allowance on her behalf. And she didn't continue it? No. Can we confirm this chap's story? Indeed we can, and have. Oh, how? Because I got him to give me the name of the solicitor he went to see. A chap named Probin. I then went round to Merbles and got him to phone Probin up. Probin confirms the whole thing. Uh -huh. uh, more than that, Probin turns out to be a sort of missing link all in his own. How do you mean? Do you remember that business of a mysterious solicitor calling on Miss Dawson? Oh, yes. Well, it was Probin. I see, yes, but... Uh... After his visit, Miss Dawson took all her affairs out of his hands and transferred her custom to a Lee Hampton firm. Oh, I see. That's what puzzled me. Yes, that's why no one seemed to know about him. But what did he go and see her about? He went to see her for the simple reason that he was an extremely capable solicitor. Oh. He'd been going into the wording of the proposed property act and realised it contained certain ambiguities. He then reviewed the position of all his clients who might become victims of these ambiguities if they were to die without making a will. And Miss Dawson was one of them. So he went down to Warner? Exactly. And unfortunately timed his arrival just after Dr. Carr told her she must have an operation. Mm, and after Carr had been talking about making wills. Yes. And of course the old girl blew up in Provin's face saying there was a conspiracy to frighten her into dying. Mm. And from that day to this he's had no contact with any member of the family whatsoever. Oh, well, well. You know... I wonder if that wasn't it. What do you mean? That old Miss Dawson thought people were trying to frighten her into dying. Mightn't that have been the cause of death? Fear? Oh, Charles. No, oh, I'm quite serious, Peter. That old lady may have died because everybody who came to call kept on talking of her dying. Yes, but how about Bertha Gotobed? You can't tell me she died of fright. Well, it was a strain of some sort on a weak heart, see what I mean? No, no, all I'm saying is we're tending to think of these cases as murder cases without the slightest shred of real evidence. Now, look... I want evidence, Peter. I know, I know. For instance, how about this fortnight at the cottage? Have you had anything through about that? Well, I had a letter from Miss Clemson this morning. Ah, and? Nothing. I see. Mary Whitaker was at the cottage for the whole fortnight in the company of Vera Featherstone. Neither made any trip to London. Mm, and it was during that fortnight that Bertha died. Yes. So, another theory goes west. I'm afraid it does. Oh, excuse me, Peter. Mm. Parker? Oh, yes. Good morning. Y yes, he is. Just hold on. It's for you, Mr. Murbles. Really? Wonder what's up. Hello, Murbles? No, not at all. Evelyn Cropper? Oh, Evelyn Cropper, Bertha's sister. I thought she was in Canada. Oh, I see. I see. That sounds interesting. Did she, Bajov? Mary Whitaker, you mean? That is interesting. Look, I think I should have a chat with Mrs. Cropper. Good. All right, Murvils. Say I'll be round to Mrs. Gulliver's to have a word with her. Goodbye. Well, oh, Charles, that was most interesting. That I gathered. Evelyn Cropper has come over from Canada to see her mother. Mm -hmm. And she's been telling Murvils of a pretty little scheme to get Miss Dawson to sign a will. A scheme that failed. Whose scheme? Mary Whitaker's. Mm -hmm. And involving the go-to-bed girls as potential witnesses. What? Oh, quite innocent witnesses. Sounds a pretty devilish piece of deception altogether. But I can see why she wanted those girls out of the house. Charles, I wonder if she knew where they'd moved to in London. Well, how do you mean? Well, look, the fact that at the time of Bertha's death, Mary was down in Kent, rules out direct involvement. It's an accomplice. Exactly. You don't mean the striking Mrs. Forrest, by any chance? Why not? Well, we haven't the slightest proof they know each other, Peter, that's why. No, but I think we ought to try and find out. Go in. Sorry to worry you, sir, but I think you should see this. I've just been going through it. What's that, Harvey? Latest missing person circulation. There, sir. Under Hampshire. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Uh, good Lord. What is it? It's something we get from the county forces when anyone goes missing. There's an entry here for Hampshire, timed at 6 p.m. yesterday. Miss V. Featherstone and Miss M. Whitaker of Lee Hampton failed to return home from day trip to coast, Wednesday, 11th of May. No. 
Lieutenant Colonel R. Featherstone informed Lee Hampton Station Officer by telephone 10 a.m. Thursday, 12th of May. Yesterday? Yes. Today is Friday the 13th. Harvey, get Lee Hampton on the line, quick as you can. Right, sir. But why did the man wait so long before reporting the girl missing? I don't know. Maybe he didn't realize she was missing. He's her father, I suppose. That sounds like it. Who well, doesn't say anything else? Uh, description of the girls, mm -hmm. home addresses. Ah, parties left Lee Hampton approximately at 9.30 a.m. Wednesday, 11th of May in Austin 7 Tourer, Blue, registration number XX9917. Registered owner, M. Whitaker, The Grove, Wellington Avenue, Lee Hampton. Destination assumed Crow's Beach. Crow's Beach. Uh, Crow's Beach police investigating. No report missing parties or vehicle up to time of origin. Six o'clock last night? Yes. Lee Hampton, superintendent's on the line now, sir. Oh, grand. It's a Mr. Johnston, sir. Thanks. Is superintendent Johnson? Ah, good morning, sir. Uh, this is Detective Inspector Parker speaking. Sorry to trouble you. But I've just seen the circulation on your two missing persons. Uh, yes, yes, that's right. Look, we may possibly have an interest in these two ladies. Uh, can you give me your latest on them? You have? Oh, what was... What? I see. And what was used, would you say? Yes, I see. And how about the other lady? No. No. Look, would you mind if I came down uh, with a colleague? Uh, this could interest us very much, I'm afraid. Yes, well, it's good of you to look at it that way. I think it would be mutual, eh? Definitely. Ye yes, fine. Yes, we'll go straight there and see your man probably by 3.30 or so. Inspector Rogers, I see. Uh, good. Uh, many thanks, sir. Goodbye. Well? They found the car, and they found Vera Featherstone. There's no trace of Mary Whitaker. And? The Featherstone girl is dead. God. It was a very powerful blow. There was a big spanner nearby. I see. Where was this, Charles? Under some gorse bushes, about ten miles along the coast from Crow's Beach. A place called Shelley's Head. How are you doing, Barton? All right, sir. Nearly through now. There's just this one. There. Good. Got everything, have you? Oh, I think so, sir. General views of the location and close-ups of the body, the spanner, and these footprints. Looks like two men and a woman. Looks like it, yes. Uh, how about the Austin? Oh, I've given you the lot on that, sir. Any ideas about the other car? Well, it's left a very clear set of tire marks. Must be a bigger car altogether from the width of tread and the depth it sunk. Any idea what make? Continental of some sort. It, it's a different sort of tyre. Well, I'd rather not say till I've looked up the tread pattern. All right, fine. Mr. Rogers? Yes? We found something else. I'll be right with you. I'll be off then, sir. Yes, fine, Barton. Uh, let's have a set of those pictures as soon as you can. All right, sir. All right, gentlemen. Uh, sorry to hold you up. Not at all. Now, what have you found? Uh, this, Inspector. It was in the glove box. Tucked inside that lubrication chart. Ah, uh, fiction magazine. Uh, American, is it? Yes. The black mask. Yes, and do you see how someone's underlined the first two words? Yes, the black. Uh, do you think it means anything? Mm, it might be a sort of message. Mm. Well, what do you make of it all? Well, it looks straightforward. Murder and abduction. Yes, the two girls are picnicking, two men arrive by car, a struggle. One girl killed by a blow from the spanner, and the other one taken off heaven knows where by heaven knows whom. Yes. The only thing we've got is that cap with the label of a firm in Stepney. It's not much to go on. No. Not a single fingerprint. Well, how about the dead girl's parents? Any help? Well, they could tell us whether Miss Whitaker called for their daughter at 9.30 in the morning the day before yesterday. The girls were just going off for the day. When they didn't come back in the evening, the Featherstones thought they'd probably just left it rather late before starting back and they decided to put up at an hotel for the night. They were expecting a phone call from them. I see. When they hadn't heard anything by the next morning, Colonel Featherstone went round to Miss Whitaker's and found the maids there knew nothing either. So then he got on to us. Hmm. Inspector, you say the police doctors have no doubt about the cause of death? None at all. Why'd you ask? I'd expected a bit more blood about summer after blowing the head as heavy as that. Oh, I see. And there are some marks around the nose and lips that look almost like chloroform burns. Oh, really? Well, I expect the doctor will be able to tell us a bit more when the body's back in the mortuary. Yes, of course. Well, you know, I think we've seen all there is to see here, Mr. Rogers, and I don't want to hold things up at all. 
Uh, should we get back to Lee Hampton? Good idea. There might be some news of Miss Whitaker. Here, you go on, and I'll join you at the station as soon as I can. Grant. Right, Peter, let's be off, shall we? This is horrible. The whole thing. Yes, it is horrible. Look, take a tip. Don't think of the girl. Just think of getting who did it. Yes. All right. I'll tell you what. I'll drop you at the Leehampton Police Station and then pair call on Miss Clemson. Oh, yes. I was forgetting her. She's pretty sure to know the girls are missing, but she won't have heard about Vera yet. Anyway, it'll be worth seeing if she knows something we don't. Yes? Mrs. Budge? Yes? Oh, good evening. I'm a friend of Miss Clemson's. Oh, yes. How do you do? It's Mr. Templeton, isn't it? Uh, yes, that's right. Oh, yes, Mr. Templeton. She left you a letter. A letter? That's right now. It's just here somewhere. Ah, there we are. Thanks. Yes, she said you might be calling. She'd had to go up to London, you see. Really? Yes, poor dear. It is her brother. They think it's pneumonia. Her brother? Oh, dear. Well, perhaps I'd... Yes, yeah, she said she'd tell you about it all in that. Such a shame, because she was so looking forward to seeing you again, she told me. But, of course, she was very worried about her brother, and I don't blame her. I know when my Good sister God. was... Yeah, well, what? This is dreadful. Yeah, well, I know she was worried about him, and uh, I don't... Mrs. Budge, uh, I must go. Do, uh, do excuse me. Well, uh, uh, won't you stay in I'm, I'm afraid I can't, Mrs. Budge. It's most kind of good. I, I must go. Oh, dear. Well, well, well what? I'll tell Miss Limson you'll call, shall I? Uh, uh, yes. Yes, of course. Tell her I call. Oh, well, poor Mr. Templeton. He was upset. Any idea what might be holding him up, Mr. Parker? Oh, it might be his car. Oh? We had some trouble getting it started. Air lock or something. And I can't imagine Miss Clemson will have much to tell him. He'll be in for a shock when he does get back here anyway. Yes. Uh, this Miss Clemson, what's she? What you or I would call an inquiry agent. Ah, uh, excuse me. Inspector Rogers? Oh, yes, pardon. Good. Yes, I see. A Renault. All right. Many thanks. Goodbye. The other car at Shelley's head. That's right. Barton's pretty sure the tires are those Renault use. You know, that rings a bell somewhere. Oh? Huh? Hmm, bells are ringing all right. Inspector Rogers. Oh, yes, put him through. It's him. Oh? Yes, Rogers here, Lord Peter. Yes, of course. Just, just hold on. Does he want me? Yes, sounds a bit edgy. I wonder what's up. Hello, Peter. Charles, I'm in a bit of a rush. I'm phoning from Guildford. Guildford? Well, just outside, the first place I could find a handy phone. Look, I can't explain everything, but Miss Clemson phoned the flat. Hmm? Bunter told her we were here, said she left me a note. Yeah? She's taken the 610 to London, and I'm after her in the car. She doesn't know Vera's dead, and I have a feeling she's walking into trouble. What do you mean? Vera sent her a letter the day she went to the coast. Oh? She got the letter yesterday. Vera wanted her advice. She thought someone was putting pressure on Mary Whitaker. How do you mean? Blackmail? I don't know. She came across some things that worried her while the two of them were staying at that cottage. She was looking around the writing desk for a pencil and found Mary's checkbook slipped under the blotter. Mary had just gone to answer the front door. Yes, well? Well, the checkbook was open so she could see the stubs. The top stub was made out to cash for £10,000. Good Lord. Well, she took a peek at the other stubs. There were three cash checks for 10000 during February and March. And blackmailers prefer cash? Yes. Miss Clemson had fixed a lunch with Mary today and was hoping to get some clue to it all then. But, of course, Mary didn't turn up. Then she heard that the girls were missing. Yes. Uh, but the other thing, Charles... Yes, but look, uh, talking of mysterious checks, wait till you hear what we've got. Uh, what? I've just had a call from the yard. Your chum, the Reverend H. Dawson, walked into a bank in Stepney this afternoon with a check for £10,000, made out to bearer, signed by Mary Whitaker, and dated yesterday. What? Yes, I thought that would shake you. The bank manager read in the London paper at lunchtime that a Mary Whitaker was one of two girls missing. When he saw that check an hour later, he phoned our chaps at Stepney. They've got the Reverend there now. But, Charles, he couldn't have... Couldn't he? How about that cap we found near the body? That came from Stepney. And how about those words on the magazine? What, the black? Meaning a West Indian. Good heavens. Uh, Charles, that check, how did he get it? Well, according to him, it came in this morning's post with no covering letter. Address on the envelope typed, postmark WC1. Uh, it doesn't ring true to me. Anyway, we're going over the check for fingerprints. If there's no sign of hers on it, it could easily be a forged signature. Yes. Uh, look, Charles, I simply must get on. I've had a horrible thought about the way these people died, and I'm dreadfully worried about Miss Clemson. Miss Clemson? What, what do you mean? Charles, at the moment, all Miss Clemson knows is that Mary Whitaker and Vera are missing. She doesn't yet know Vera's dead. 
She's desperately concerned about the girl and is very bravely trying to find out on her own what's going on. The point is Vera told her something else she found at the cottage. What? A delivery note from Fortnum and Mason. A delivery note? Addressed to our old friend Mrs. Forrest. No. That's who Miss Clemson thinks is behind all this, and I'm pretty sure she's right. But don't you see, Charles? I simply got to get to Mrs. Forrest before Miss Clemson... Yes, but Peter, if that note... It... Peter? Oh, blast. Has he hung up? Yes. Good Lord, Rogers. Those tyre marks. What, the Renault's? Yes. Mrs. Forrest runs a Renault. And who's Mrs. Forrest? Oh, oh no. no. Shall I answer? Please. Inspector Rogers' office. May I speak to Inspector Parker, if he's there, please? Parker speaking. Who's that? Sergeant Harvey from the yard, sir. Oh, yes, Harvey? It's about that check, sir. Yes? Uh, we put it through for fingerprints, and we've got prints of four different people. Yeah. Dawson, who brought it in, the cashier, the manager, and a fourth person. Mm. Nothing on the records for any of them. Oh, I see. So that's that. Uh, not quite, sir. It's that fourth person. There's a right-hand thumbprint on the check. Very clear impression. What about it? Well, it matches something we've got in the office. What? Yes, sir. A thumbprint on that photograph Lord Peter gave us. We have it filed under the name of Forrest at an address in South Audley Street. Good evening, madam. Oh, uh, good evening, Porter. Turned a bit chilly? Yes. Uh, do you know your way, madam? Uh, 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 Mrs. Forrest, I want. I, I think she's flat number three. That's right, madam. Second floor. The lift's just here. Oh, uh, thank you. Just press the button mark second, madam, and when you get out, flat three's on your right. Oh, thank you so much. Yes? Oh, good evening. I, I wonder if I might trouble you for a few moments. It, it's about our mission settlement. Uh, uh, I'd very much like to tell you something about the work we do. The, the settlement's in the East End, and we're most anxious to get as much support as possible. Come in. And, oh, uh, oh, may I? That's really most kind of you. Um, uh, through here? Yes. Yes, yes, we, we have such a dedicated band of helpers, and they do such a very worthwhile job. But, of course, as you may imagine, the question of funds is always in a... Oh. <laughs> yes, it, 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 it's, it's always a, a, a matter of making ends meet, you see. So w what we're hoping to do is to add to our circle of subscribers. Now, I, I wonder if you might perhaps be willing to... to... Yes. Willing to do what? <gasps> to do what, Miss Clemson? It's you. Yes, Miss Clemson, it's me. <laughs> Keep away. Well, what's that thing you've got? Hypodermic? That's right. <laughs> Keep it away from me. Oh, you needn't worry. There's nothing in it. Keep away. Keep away. No. 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 Yes, no. Miss Clemson. <laughs> Yes. You needn't worry, my dear Miss Clemson. There's nothing in it. What the hell? Stay right where you are, if you please. That's she. That's a woman. What the hell are you doing here? Stay right where you are. What's the meaning of this? Who are you? You're not the porter. No, madam, and you're not Mrs. Forrest. What? I'm a police officer, madam. Sergeant Harvey, Scotland Yard. No. Constable. Sergeant. See the lady, will you? Yes, Sergeant. Right. Mary Whitaker, alias Forrest, I arrest you on the charge of... Yes? ...of attempted murder for a start. Is that all? No, Miss Whitaker, very probably not. And I must warn you that anything you say may be taken down and used in evidence at your trial. Trial? Oh, look, this is quite outrageous. Your whole attitude. This woman forced her way into my flat and attacked me. And how is it that she's now lying on the floor unconscious? It was self-defence. I struggled with her and she fell against the table. Indeed, Miss Whitaker. Now, would you mind passing me that hypodermic, please? This? Yes, please. Oh, well, very well. Thank you. I don't know why you're bothering about that. It's, it's what I use for my neuralgia injections. Really? Yes. It's completely harmless. There's nothing in it. But, of course, that's just how you like it. 
Miss Whitaker. What the devil do you mean? I wouldn't exactly call that hypodermic harmless. It doesn't need anything in it, the way you use it. Now, are you really sure you're all right, Miss Crimson? Oh, perfectly. Sure? Oh, perfectly, thank you, Mr. Parker. Mm, here we are, my lord. Ah, Bunter, splendid. Miss Crimson will be most grateful. Do you care to try this, madam? Oh, thank you. Uh, what is it? It's Bunter's patent pick-me-up, Miss Crimson. Do you the world of good, I strongly recommend it. Really? But mightn't I get intoxicated? You might. But after what you've been through, why not? Well, uh, all right. Oh, <coughs> I say it. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> there. What did I tell you? Oh, it's, it's really good, Bunter. Thank you very much. Not at all, madam. Thank you. Well, there we are, Charles. The end of the case. Mm. And nearly the end of you, Miss Clemson. Oh. What a day it's been. Oh, that woman's face, Lord Peter. I, I just can't believe I'm alive. I can imagine. But I still don't understand about the hypodermic. There wasn't any poison in it or anything. I know there wasn't. That was the whole idea. But how did you get onto it? Mrs. Myrtle. Your car? Yes. Remember this morning when I got to your office late? She had an airlock in her petrol feed? Of course. And we had the same trouble this afternoon. Exactly. The whole thing came to be suddenly on the way back to town. When I got to Hyde Park, I found a call box and ran Dr. Carr to see what he thought. He could, as they say, have, have kicked himself. But you mean the hypodermic was only injecting air? Nothing but air. Oh. Um, look. The heart pushes blood round the body, right? It acts as a pump, yes, yes. like the petrol pump in a car. Introduce a blockage into the bloodstream, and the heart stops pumping. I see. You see? The hypodermics fill with air. This is injected into the bloodstream. The air bubble causes a blockage, and the result? Just another case of heart failure. No special symptoms, nothing. Only one thing. What? Somewhere, the tiny mark of the needle, mm. if you happen to be looking for it. Yes. Oh, what a wicked mind to think of a thing like that. Wicked and knowledgeable. She's a fully qualified nurse, don't forget. Oh, yes. And of course, as Carr pointed out, the one thing a nurse has to do when giving an injection, a normal injection, is to be completely positive there's no air trapped in the hypodermic. Yes, of course. But Mr. Parker, I... Yes? Yeah. Well, now, that sergeant, I thought, was the porter. How did he come to be there in time? Because I sent him. He phoned me at Leehampton with some information that proved Mrs. Forrest and Mary Whitaker were one and the same person. Ah, oh, that woman had us fooled. I suppose all that bleached hair was a wig. Yes, as a matter of fact, it was. And that makeup? I know. Uh, well, as soon as I knew about Mrs. Forrest, I knew you were definitely walking into trouble, Miss Clemson. I got Harvey to go straight round to the flats and contact the real porter. As luck would have it, the chap had spare keys to all the flats in case of fire. Ah. So Harvey borrowed the key to the flat, and while he was about it, the porter's uniform. It wasn't too bad a fit, I <laughs> <laughs> It wasn't. You see, we thought it could well be best to let you go on up to the flat when you got there, Miss Clemson, but with Harvey to keep an eye on you, just thinking he was the porter. Wouldn't worry oh, you. I see what you mean. Well, then he went through to the entrance hall and waited for developments. You arrived first, and you just after, I gather, Peter. Just as Miss Clemson's taxi was pulling away, about 30 seconds behind. Good heavens! The moment you got into the lift, the sergeant and I made a dash for the stairs. We got up to the second floor just as you were doing your stuff about the mission settlement. <laughs> then she let you in. And when we heard the sitting room door close, we used the spare key to let ourselves in, oh, too. That's amazing! But you know, what I don't understand, Lord Peter, is why. Why did she do all those terrible things? Why? God knows. Greed, I suppose. Oh, yes. In fairness to her, Miss Dawson did want her to have her money when she died. The catch was the old girl wouldn't commit herself in writing. Then, when the Reverend Hallelujah turned up and the New Property Act began to be discussed, she realised her position might be very precarious. Mm. But when you think of it, there are only two things she could do. Either trick Miss Dawson into making a will, or see that she died before the New Act came into force. Yes. Yes. Well, we heard today that, in fact, she tried a spot of trickery, but Miss Dawson caught her out. So that was that. She got the go-to-bed girls innocently standing by to witness the signing, instead of which they witnessed a row. And their knowledge of that row made them potentially dangerous. Yes. Well, she dismissed them. I must have made a point of knowing where they had gone to in London. Mm -hmm. But as regards her aunt, she was left with the simple alternative of seeing she died before the 1st of January 1926. And she did so with her little hypodermic. <laughs> Horrible. 
But, Lord Peter, now, about poor Bertha go to bed. Now, if Mary Whitaker was down at the cottage at the time she died, how can Mary have murdered her? Because at that time she wasn't at the cottage. What? She'd spotted by advertisement for the go-to-beds and had gone up to London. But Vera said she never left the cottage. Vera lied. I can't believe it. You have to believe it. Because when we interviewed Mrs. Forrest, she admitted being in London at the time in question. And as we now know, Mrs. Forrest is, in fact, Mary Whitaker. Yes, yes of course. So Vera was lying. Oh. But only out of loyalty. Because Mary asked her to say she'd never left the cottage. Mm. Though she couldn't have realised why she asked her that. She thought the trip to London was simply to pay off a blackmailer. She didn't know it was to murder Bertha. She sent you that letter because she liked you, trusted you, and simply had to tell you about those cheques. But it's my guess she'd never have told you of Mary's trip to London. I think you're right. But those cheques, where was the money going? To Mrs. Forrest, I'd say. Yes. Mrs. Forrest? The double identity. At any time, if things got difficult, Miss Whitaker could disappear and Mrs. Forrest carry on. But to do so, Mrs. Forrest had to have money. Of course. And a bank account. So, Mary Whitaker draws cash in Lee Hampton, and Mrs. Forrest pays it into her bank in South Audley oh. Street. Simple, isn't it? Yes, her big mistake was that five-pound note, the one in Bertha's handbag. Without that, we'd have known nothing of Mrs. Forrest at all. That little visit we paid her must have got her rattled. I think that was when she decided to stage her disappearance. As Mary Whitaker? Yes. They really should have done better the other way round. But why murder poor little Vera? Simply to make things look convincing. One young woman bashed on the head with a spanner, the other spitted away by a couple of but tufts. But Vera would have done anything for her. She... I know. But as far as Mary was concerned, Vera was expendable. I think that's her whole attitude to humanity. She probably did it after they had their picnic. Vera's most likely having a snooze. Mary won't risk killing her with a spanner. She's hardly experienced in that direction. So she puts her properly asleep with a little chloroform, does her usual neat job with a hypodermic, and then as soon as the girl is dead, lays on some blows with the spanner. And because Vera's blood's already stopped flowing, the spanner doesn't cause much of a mess. Yes, of course. Well, then, Mary nips through the gorse to the Renault, which she's driven down from London the day before. In it, she's got that magazine, the Black Mask. Two pairs of men's shoes to make footprints, and the cat from Stephanie. And off she goes to London in the Renault. Exactly. This all happens the day before yesterday. Yesterday, she takes a short trip to her pillar box in WC1, and posts a bearer check for £10,000 to the Reverend Hallelujah Dawson, who lives, or purely by chance, in Stepney. Yes, he gets the check this morning, goes round to a bank this afternoon, and is held by Stepney police on suspicion of murdering Vera Featherstone and abducting Mary Whitaker for the purposes of illegal gain. What a mind that woman must have. It's, mm. it's frightening. It is. I'd hate to play chess with her. Uh, oh. Old Hallelujah must have been thrilled by that check there, Charles. He must have thought you'd had a change of heart. He'll be dreadfully disappointed not to get that money. Who said he won't get it? Uh, Charles, you old devil. It's a perfectly good check for £10,000, signed by Mary Whitaker. No reason why it shouldn't be cleared in the ordinary course of business. Charles, I take my hat off to you. Thank you, my lord. Most kind of you. But you know, there's just one thing about all this that worries me. I wonder if you thought about it. What's that? Proof. Proof? Evidence. Look, I agree with everything you've said. I'm confident that that woman has committed three murders and attempted a fourth tonight. And at this moment, she's in the cells at Savile Road, charged with that attempt. But with a good defence, there's a strong chance she may get off. Oh, surely not. Well, she may stick to her story that Miss Clemson attacked but, her. But that's nonsense. Yes, I know. Of course it's nonsense. We all know that. But can we convince a jury it's nonsense? That's our job now. That and getting enough real evidence over the other deaths. Well, we've a certain amount, but I'm not at all sure it's enough. We need enough for a conviction. Ah, oh, I wonder who this is. It's well past eleven. Hello? Yes, that's right. Well, certainly. He's just here. It's for you, Charles. Savile Row Police Station. Oh, right. Parker here. Oh, yes, what is it, Sergeant? What? But wasn't there any... I see. Right, there's nothing you can do. I'll be straight over. We're too late, are we? I'm afraid we are. Suicide. Oh, no. In her cell. She tied a sheet to the window bars and strangled herself. May God rest her soul. Yes. So, you don't get your conviction, Charles? No. I don't get a conviction. But you do get proof. Mm, you could call it that, Peter. I think so, yes. 
I think you could call it proof. Unnatural Death, the novel by Dorothy L. Sayers, was dramatised for radio by David Geary. The part of Lord Peter Whimsey was played by Hugh Burden and Detective Inspector Charles Parker by Clifford Norgate. Bunter, William Edel. Miss Clemson, Catherine Parr. Mrs. Forrest, Eva Haddon. Mrs. Budge, Kathleen Helm. Nurse Fillimore, Kate Binchy. Sergeant Harvey, John Rowe. Merbles, Louis Stringer, Vera Featherstone, Jilly Gratham, Inspector Rogers, Edward Kelsey, P.C. Barton, Graham Allen, and Dr. Carr, John Sampson. The play was produced by David H. Godfrey. <laughs>